Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today will be my last broadcast of 2023. Sorry to see it go, but I wanted to end with a New Year's Eve hangout. We're calling this the Great New Year's Eve Hangout and Throw Out, and I've got a couple of friends joining me. If you watch Christmas Eve, we did a Christmas Eve hangout where we discussed all things related to weight loss and food addiction with three people that are very important to me because they are my coaches. They either coach in the programs that I run online, like the masterclass or the 21 day course or the reboot. They've taken all the courses or they're my YouTube moderators, but they know a lot about this topic. And today, what we're going to talk about is whether or not your environment, meaning where you live, environments anywhere you are, has anything to do with your success on a health or weight loss or trying to manage food addiction journey. Please welcome back to the show, Jesse, Susanna, and Zena in alphabetical order. Let me put you guys in gallery mode. And I want to I want to uh, show you guys something. We did this on New Year's Eve. So Christmas was the next day. And I got them all the same Christmas presents. So what did what, you guys get for Christmas from Santa AJ? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all purple. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to be talking about, whether or not that is a true statement. If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And I'm going to just go first, and then I'm going to be quiet and let you ladies tell me your experience. I, I didn't make this up. I mean, I may I might have coined the phrase, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. But I went to True North as a patient, Martin Luther King Jr.'s weekend in 2011. So that's almost 12 years ago when I met Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Ellen Goldhammer. And it was the very first lecture that Dr. Lyle gave. And it wasn't even about weight loss. He was, I don't know what he was talking about. People were asking, it was a Q&A. And I wrote down these words that I never forgot, which was... We must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. The number one rule for healthy living is no junk food in the house. And so that's how I've been living my life. And that's what I've been trying to teach other people. But I get a lot of resistance. So I'll let you ladies tell me what you think about that rule, if it is a rule. Well, for me, um, I will just say that I have lived in a clean environment and I'm currently in an unclean environment. And um, while it's not impossible to do this in an unclean environment, it is much, much harder. Um, so yes, I do believe the statement. I use the statement very often. And um, it's just, it's easier. If it's not there, it's hard to eat it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you can, of course, you can get in your car and drive somewhere to the corner store and get it. <laughs> but a lot of times, you know, just the effort to do that is more than the, you know, the desire to get the thing. So yeah, I personally feel, because I'm a very compulsive type of personality. And if it's something's in front of me, it's like usually in my mouth before I, before I've even had a chance to process the thought. So yes, for me, I will say that is a very, very true statement. Zena, you had taken the McDougal program many times before I met you. Did Dr. McDougal ever mention anything about not having junk food in the house? You know, it's been it's been quite a while because the first McDougal program I did was back in 2003. And then um, many, you know, I went to many other ones throughout the years. But I do remember Dr. Lyle talking about it because Dr. Lyle was the psychologist for the McDougal program. I met him at the same time that I met um, Dr. McDougal. And so back in 2003 was when I learned about the pleasure trap. And that was something he lectured on, you know, lectured about. I don't know. It's like if I took it in at, at that point. I was living by myself at the time. So I was in control of my environment and I, you know, it was pretty clean for the way I was eating when I came back. I mean, I did have stuff from before I got rid of it. Um, Mary McDougal talked about it also, like, you know, stocking your pantry, stocking your fridge, you know, getting like the healthy stuff in there. Um, you know, so they did talk about it. I don't know that the focus was so much about that though, rather than learning about what the healthy diet really was. So, um, but yeah, they talked about shopping. They talked about replacing, you know, getting stocking up on, you know, fridge, freezer, pantry with really healthy stuff. And um, like I said, Dr. Lyle, definitely going through the pleasure trap. He talked about that also. Nice. You know, like you said, you can't eat something that's not there. 
And I always believe that even if it doesn't call to you right now, the minute you have a bad day, a busy day, a hungry day, it's there. And, and I, I learned from Esther, who thought that I was making this up, she was going to prove me wrong with the seized candy. She said, well, it was in my house until it was in my mouth. So, you know, the thing is, is willpower is a very short lived commodity and you have to exercise it so many times per day anyway, to make all these decisions. And you don't have to exercise any type of willpower to in a clean environment, at least when it comes to eating food, that's not there. Yes, that's very, very true. And it's, you asked me something last week when we did this on Christmas day and um, about what calls to me, like, because I mentioned that I have things in my house for my mother, who's 94 years old and dependent on me to get her her food and stuff. And although she's now eating vegan, <laughs> she's not necessarily eating healthy vegan. And I don't push that because I've pushed as far as I can, you know, she's stuck in the pleasure trap and, but that's the way it is. And you had asked me what about her food calls to me, whether, whether it was the smell or the sight of it. And I, I was having a hard time answering in the moment, but afterwards, shortly after we signed off, I was thinking about it because that was a really good question that you posed to me, AJ. And I was thinking that part, a big part of it, I think, is the memory because even if something's in a is in um, a wrapper and I'm not, it's not being cooked or whatever, I'm not smelling it right then. You know, I see it, and if it's something that I've had more recently, the memory is much stronger. Even if it's something that I haven't had in years and years and years, I still have a memory of what that tastes like. And sometimes it's just the memory of it that's calling to me. So it would it's much easier if it's not there to call to me. And so I just wanted to mention that. Absolutely. So what's your experience been, Jesse? <laughs> well, I was going to say I should go last because okay. I think all right, all right. All right, you go less. Susanna, okay. what's your experience been? Well, you have a, I, mouth, a mouth full of kids. You have a house full of kids. <laughs> I, do. I, do. I, have, I have eight kids. Um, some of them are grown and gone now, but, you know, quite a few still live here, especially like over Christmas. Got three in university, so they were all home, plus the two that still live at home, plus my daughter and her husband live in our basement suite. So it was, was a big crew. And uh, so I was thinking back to when I first started, because I've lost 72 pounds with you and really got my life back and feel amazing at almost 57. I have so much more energy than I used to. And so for me, I, I had to come to grips with the fact that I am not going to live in a clean environment until all my kids are gone. And I'm not in any rush for that to happen. So how do I make this program work? in the situation that I'm in. And so what I realized is that I could make micro environments that catered to me and my husband who also eats this way. So in my very first reboot course that I took with you, um, Zena and Pam were the moderators. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I've got all these potato chips and crappy stuff here. And so one of you suggested, why don't you like put them somewhere where the kids can access them, but but it won't be like something in your line of sight. And so like I'm in Canada, so we have these real Canadian superstore bins. <laughs> and so I put all their stuff like down, they're quite big, they're for grocery shopping. And so I put all their stuff in there and then put it on top of my extra fridge in my laundry room. And, you know, funny enough, the stuff still lives up there even now, two years later, two plus years later, because what that did is took, took it out of my vision. Every time when I was going to get something to eat, I wasn't having potato chips calling me and that kind of thing. And so that was one thing that I did. And then actually just so that I could say that I am, what is that expression? You've got to walk the talk. So this afternoon, I set a timer for 30 minutes and I went into my pantry. I have a smallish pantry and uh, and I I've been thinking about this and I decided I want to have two shelves that are just for me. So it doesn't um, it doesn't make sense logically like any any sort of, you know, home organizer would say all the cereal goes together, all the this goes together, all the this. That's not working for me because I keep seeing their stuff. And sure enough today, so I was in there on the little step stool, pulling stuff down to make my own two shelves. And look what I found. I found two bottles of syrup 
from Starbucks. These are mine, were mine, and these were living way at the back. I'd forgot, long forgotten about them. But anyway, I just want to encourage everybody to get in there and throw some stuff out. <laughs> you know, you don't need it. This is the night to do it, guys. Yeah, this is a good night to do it. And even, you know, just like I did, set a timer. Just set yourself 30 minutes to pull some stuff out of there. And I'm so happy with how far I got today. And it kind of helped me conceptualize how I'm going to keep working on it. So nice. You know, I, I, and again, I don't want to ever make people feel bad if they can't be in a clean environment. I feel though that a cleaner environment can almost always be negotiated. I mean, even if you're in a prison cell, I've seen, I knew, I know two people, unfortunately, that have been to prison there, then there were some workarounds. I've, I, I've never seen anyone in a clean, clean environment not succeed, but I certainly have seen a lot of people in unclean environments struggle time and time again. And I keep putting a call out there to the people that are in a completely unclean environment that are having tremendous success. And nobody wants to come on the show and talk about that because you can't just define success by weight loss because I know people can be in an unclean environment, lose weight, but then they're white knuckling it because if they're always having cravings or having to hear somebody crunch granola or, or toast toast. I mean, that's not living. If you're, if you're living in an unclean environment and having outward success with weight loss, but you're still struggling internally to me, that's not success because that's not a calm, stable brain. That's not freedom in my opinion. Well, like, for example, you'd mentioned toast. So I was like a total bread addict. I made my own bread for over 25 years. I ground my own flour. Like I was, bread was my a big part of my life. And so for the whole first year and a half of the program, I didn't make bread, maybe two years. Um, I didn't, I couldn't make it. I couldn't deal with the smell or anything, but, and I felt really bad buying it because I bought, you know, I would buy organic wheat and everything. And, you know, so anyway, it is doable, but I have definitely had to put in some, a lot of workarounds. Same with baking, baking cookies, baking cakes. I did all of that. And I, I, I can't really do it anymore. I have to just buy stuff for, yeah. you know, I, I agree with you. All right, Jesse, who wanted to go last? <laughs> well, I wanted to go last because I know that Susanna and Zena have both succeeded with weight loss, despite not having clean environments. And in our case, we have a very clean environment. My husband and I both eat, <laughs> you know, uh, whole food, plant-based. We've been vegan for a long time, a much longer time than whole food, plant-based. But we are two people who don't mind driving 10 miles to get something. And we've done that. And with us, it doesn't take very much um, breaking the program to get set back in terms of weight loss. So um, we've both succeeded in terms of health. We've had small successes in terms of weight maintenance and a little bit of weight loss, but we can sabotage ourselves at the drop of a car key and, you know, a drive to the store. So when we go to the store, we're never tempted to get anything we shouldn't have. We come home, we've got all this great food here and we can fight off temptation a lot of times, meaning we're thinking about something. And sometimes we don't reinforce that in each other. And sometimes we do. And those are the times when being together is an issue. So, um, a, you know, a clean environment is 99% of it. And the rest of it is still comes down to willpower and sticking with the program. Mm. Well, you know what I was thinking? If you're going 10 miles away, you're probably driving. Is there a way? We're, like not, we're not going 10 miles. We would, <laughs> but we don't have to. It's it's right. just a couple of miles. <laughs> okay, no, what I was saying, though, you're probably not going to walk it. So is there a way we can, like, I don't know, have a neighbor take your distributor cap off at night? Or, or, or Actually, can we get... My husband has gone, he has walked it. Okay. Because sometimes yeah, um, he'll say... <laughs> What if we make wanted posters with you and your husband's photo and then bring it to these places and say, right. do not serve these people. You know, they do that sometimes with people that are recovering alcoholics. So uh, yeah. family members will yeah. do that and say, do not serve this person. Do not serve, you know, and they, I don't know. Yeah, that's. Uh, well, we're working on, on coming up with strategies for this for ourselves because we're sick and tired of, of sabotaging ourselves. We're not going to do that anymore. And actually, we've had over three weeks of success. So I'm not going to go into any more detail because I don't want to jinx us. 
but um, but we think we actually have come up with a way to deal with this. So you don't have to tell us now, but once you're convinced it works, share it so that it help other people. We will. And yeah. I, can I say, ask Jesse something? Jesse, if you didn't live in an unclean environment, wouldn't it be that much harder for you? If you had stuff in the house, um, uh, that's currently oh. going out to get. You know, there are very few things that call to me anymore. I think that's true of my husband also. So there is an awful lot of stuff that I could have around. Um, after I quit smoking, I was around people who smoked all the time. I had just made the decision and I made the commitment and stuck with it. I don't know what's going on with the food thing. I mean, it's I, I can't believe it's actually a worse addiction except that it is different from cigarettes. You don't need cigarettes to live. You do need food to live. So there's something going on. We think maybe we've got a handle on a strategy. We, we really do. And this is the first time we've actually come up with something that seems to work. But we'll see. We, it's interesting because you have two people. And if, <laughs> if, 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 one, if one could be the bad cop, it'd be a lot easier, right. you know? But it sounds and like a lot, of times, two good a lot of times that is what happens. One of us will prevent the other one from, you know, from leading us astray. But sometimes <laughs> it's just the wrong time for both of us. And then, boy, look out. Don't get in our way if we're on our way to get some Numinos or something. So, now, let me ask you this. When you get the Numinos, do you eat the Numinos outside or do you bring some in? Because that could actually be a rule that only eat it outside. That, you know, because we don't we're, we're not so that unrealistic where we tell people you can never have something else again and you're never oh. going to want or eat it again. But a good rule could be I only eat this outside the house and then you eat what you can, even if it means the whole package, but it doesn't come in the house. It's sort of like if you know anybody that's kosher, uh, they don't bring unkosher food in the house. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person that's ever kept kosher didn't eat something unkosher, but they don't bring it in the house because then there's like rituals and cleanings like they had. That, like my parents weren't perfect kosher people, but they wanted the rabbi to always be able to eat in the house. And so the house was perfectly kosher. Like there were no, um, they never cheated with that. But if they were out, they might have something that wasn't kosher. Do you know what I'm saying? But that yeah. was like, uh, like just sort of like um, people have vegan households. So that's why, can, can you make a rule like, hey, no junk food in the house. If we, you know, it, it's too bad you don't live like in a tundra where it's like 10 degrees below and you'd really have to want to go out and get it. But that's one thing. And then the other thing that Dr. Lyle has suggested to people is before you eat something unhealthy, eat something healthy first. So if I was faced with a situation where I wanted something really hyper palatable, I would eat my very favorite thing that was compliant first and then like wait a half hour and say, okay, if I still want it, I'll have it. But nine times out of 10, whatever I'm eating is so delicious and makes me so full, you know? We have not even been tempted to bring anything into the house for a little over three weeks. And we do know that eating something we love does not change it if we want it. That's one, That was one of the first things we tried, because that's what works for so many people, right, is to get full or have something else or just wait it out. But we can, you know, wait for three or four hours and still want that. So we've had we've had a real problem with a simultaneous overwhelming urges. If they're not simultaneous, you know, pretty much we can we can avoid it. Have but, you uh, ever heard of any of the strategies? Well, I'm sure you've heard of it because you've been <laughs> in the food. But um, have you ever implemented any of the strategies that Jen Pierre talks about? Rinsing with clove oil, having a green drink, you know, green powder, those kind of things. Yep. And I'm one of the ones that suggested brushing their teeth because sometimes that works for me, but not all the time. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of little things that can work sometimes for us, but not yeah. always. And it just doesn't take much to really, to undo whatever, you know, because you don't lose actual fat that quickly. So you've really got to, on, on you know, to a much greater extent than we've been able to manage, you've got to be able to stick with what you're doing. So that's where we are. We think we we think actually think because we've had three plus weeks, which is pretty damn good for us really without good. being tempted, not mm -hmm. having to white knuckle it, but with really saying, you know what, I didn't feel like having anything today. And that's that's a change or this week or now two weeks and three weeks. So 
Congratulations. <laughs> I'll read some of the comments because I know you guys can't see them. Elle says, I'm usually good in an unclean environment, but Christmas has gotten to me, gained three pounds and now excited to be getting back to it. I look forward to it. Uh, Bonnie says, I must admit, I have to get back on track. I'm surrounded by junkers. So <laughs> we feel you. Okay. There was a comment here. About, um, I agree. If it's in the house, you'll be constantly tempted, says Rhonda. Um, Tracy says my husband, my hubby brought vegan pizza and I got a smell and a slice went in my mouth and it honestly wasn't worth eating. I didn't feel good afterwards. Yeah. I always yeah. feel like it's like three moments of pleasure for like three days of pain or however long. You true. Decide it's to absolutely true. Yep. However long you decide to beat yourself up for, and that's, that's up to you. I saw something from somebody in an unclean environment. So I'm going to finish with some of these comments. Gunther says, Happy New Year. I'll be starting on New Year's Day to get on and stay on the plant-based, starch-based lifestyle, especially with the high cost of processed food. Welcome back. If you strayed. Okay. Uh, I saw something. My value is clear. Okay. I saw something about somebody that's in an unclean environment. Um, yeah. And again, this is the other thing. What is clean is from person to person. What what I define as clean. So, for example, somebody saying I can't have bread in my house, but I can have flour. I, I can have some grains, but no flour. But like, for example, I, I don't have white flour in the house, but let's say I had it because I wanted to do some paper mache. I'm not going to eat white flour. You know, I, I I mean, I don't think would any of us actually eat white flour. So I, you know, and I wouldn't eat wheat flour because I'm gluten intolerant. So I probably could have flour in the house, but I don't look at flour as food, but bagels, you know, that's a whole nother story. Things that are made out of flour could be uh, problematic. I, I posted to the chat. What do you think of the statement? If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. Uh, okay. Okay. I saw something. See, this is the problem when you have your moderators on the show. They can't be <laughs> monitoring the chat for you. Um, uh, Nuita says, that saying has saved me during every grocery shop. Very good. And uh, I live in a clean, I live in a non-clean home, says Jennifer, and it can be tough in times of celebration with family. Sometimes it makes me mad, but I just need to refocus on what I need and make sure that I have it. Yeah. Okay. I, I've got to find that saying because it was about, for me, success is, is to be prepared, to be full and make sure I always have my food available so I can enjoy the moment and not stress. Here is the one I was looking for. Susan says, I shop and cook for my husband who eats donuts for breakfast and meat for dinner. I have lost 67 pounds in the past year. Congratulations, wow. Susan. Yeah, it's tremendous. Sometimes I'm tempted by some things I make for him, but for the most part, I have just accepted this way and can stay clean eating. He enjoys my food, but has meat with it. My weight has stayed steady over the holidays and I'm hoping to drop 20-ish more pounds in the coming year. So that's great. You know, I, I it, not to put a, what's a, like, what's, what's the word I'm thinking? A, a cloud over that. You know, I, I, sometimes at the beginning of a weight loss journey, people are, either more motivated or more, I don't know what the word is. And this is, and, you know, and then down the road, something that may not bother you today may bother you another time, which is why it's important to know yourself and what you can and cannot have. Because like, like we talked about, like Zena said, she's susceptible to anything that's crap. I always use the example of this candy made by Brock called circus peanuts. There were these orange peanuts that I, where I didn't, I didn't like them as a child. I didn't like them. Now you could flood my house with them. And I'm pretty sure I'm never going to eat them because I didn't like them before. So I don't like red licorice, for example. I don't, I always hate, I always had a chemical taste to me, Twizzlers, but I love black, <laughs> you know? So, so that's the other thing. Like for those of you in an unclean environment, like if you have to buy him donuts, uh, does he care what flavor? Like if that happened to me, I would buy the worst flavor that I could think of. Like one that I didn't <laughs> like, like, you know, that one they used to make that had like no frosting on it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like a cake like, donut? It was like a cake donut. There was like no glaze, no like frosting I, and like, Ugh, who who would eat that, you know? So um, mm -hmm. uh, Gina says she appreciates your genuine honesty. And uh, Rhonda says, I will never leave in a, live in a clean environment because my husband will always eat sad. I just have to be strong and remind myself each day I can do it. Keeping a food diary helps tremendously. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. So is there anything in your house you can throw out, Jesse? Or is it completely clean? And Zena? Our house really is clean. Um, that's why I'm saying it's embarrassing because 
here are two people who have succeeded, you know, in circumstances that, like you're saying, are very difficult at best. And we have not yet succeeded. <laughs> and we have no excuse other than, you know, just a huge, overwhelming addiction. Well, 2024 is going to be your year for sure. That's what we've been telling ourselves. <laughs> Jean says, at this moment, my desire for non-compliant food has been shut off. I don't want to cross that line and turn it back on either. Once I cross that line, it's too hard to get back the calmness. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem for some people that can have a little treat now and then. But, you know, you all have seen these people. We're all, we've been together for years, the, the four of us in a variety of group. And then, you know, it, it'd be... If they have a snack accident. That's what I call it when they eat something that really they hadn't planned to. And some people can then the next meal just go right back on and other people, they, they disappear for a long time. Like that one, it's like one drink, one drunk kind of thing with some people. That's why you have to know how vulnerable you are to the effects of these foods, you know? And that's why I think it's like on a continuum. That's why some people probably can live in a less clean environment. I just feel that if you can do whatever it takes to have a clean environment, it's just going to be easy for you, easier. And that's why, you know, it's New Year's Eve and ask, ask your loved ones if they would like run an experiment with you and just give you this gift of a clean environment for 30 days just to test it out. And, you know, what do they got to lose? I think the thing is, is usually the other people in the house have food addictions, whether they have weight problems or not. They don't want to live in a house that's that's clean. Very I true. was really surprised. Um, I think I told you about this, AJ. I had a really cool conversation in the summertime with my 20 year old. He was home from university and he had bought some sort of junk food and just left it sitting on the island. And I said to him, you know, do you think you could just keep that in your room? It's just really hard for me to see that every time I walk by it. And, you know, they've seen me through this whole process, like, you know, losing this almost 75 pounds in two and a bit years. And, and he really surprised me. He said, that still bothers you. And so these, you know, a lot of people that you live with might not actually understand food addiction the way that we have been students of food addiction and learning about it. And the other thing I was going to say too, um, is that I, I, over time, I've noticed um, exactly what Dr. Lyle talks about how, um, how when the food goes out of season, so to speak, so even pizza goes out of season or cupcakes, go, donuts, whatever your poison is, as those things go out of season, it actually does start to um, calm down the cravings. And that's what, that's what I love <laughs> because I was addicted to everything. I like, I just, and by the time I maxed out at well, 258.8 pounds, I'm, I'm five foot 11. By the time I was maxed out at a 36 and a half BMI, I'd given up, right? I just, I, I just ate whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted, because there was no hope for me. And that's what this has given me is, is a path out of that addiction. And that's what the clean environment even if it's a micro environment has helped me like, so, so because we're a big family, we can, um, we're, we were fortunate enough to get a third fridge. I know that seems like a lot of fridges, but when you have 11 people that you're feeding in the summer, then that's not, you know, a lot of families with four people have two fridges. So we have a fridge in the garage that is only produce. And so literally I ride my bike around and, and have a couple of baskets and things and a backpack. And I fill it up with about 150. I know that about $150 worth of produce can fit in there and I'll ride into the garage and I'll just literally load it all into my produce fridge. And then I can see, you know, and everything kind of has its place. I'm not a super organized person, but like I can glance down and go, okay, next trip, I'm going to need more zucchini or I'm almost out of kale or whatever it is. So that's just something that has helped me is that's like yet another micro environment is this produce fridge. Because sometimes if, you know, if I'm in a rush and I shove a couple things away in the kitchen fridge, then I'm all unorganized again. I've got carrots here. I've got mushrooms there. Everything in one place has really helped me to be a little bit more organized. No. Yep. So I'm curious, Jesse, when you quit smoking, did you keep any tobacco products in your house? No, uh, everybody smoked around me at work, but, um, but no, I mean, I just quit cold Turkey. 
after 25 years, three day, uh, three pack a day habit. That's um, amazing though. Congratulations uh, yes. on that. However, do you have any strategies however, for that? Just out of, I mean, we don't, we probably don't have a large audience that smokes, but do you have any strategies for how you did that? You just made a decision one day. I, I just made a decision and it, it was because of Richard. I mean, we had, we had met and gotten together. He didn't smoke, never had. And I just decided he was a hell of a lot more important than a cigarette. I do have to say though, that after 24 years of not smoking, I started smoking again and smoked for three years and then stopped again. I so, hear that's actually not uncommon actually, Dr. Lyle. Well, about that. Yeah. I dreamed of smoking during that whole time. I mean, to the extent that I would wake up and think, oh my God, I've started smoking again. It was that bad. Um, and, and still is, I would say that cigarettes have been a, you know, that's been a, a huge addiction for me, but, um, it's been, um, six years since I last quit 24 years in between the first time and starting. And I smoked for three years. I never smoked more than 10 or 15 a day at that point, as opposed to the three packs, but, um, it was just as hard to stop. That's just so interesting. You know, I, did you ever try anything like the lozenges or the patch? Did it, did that help at all? I, I never was willing to try them. I really thought that they were not a good thing. <laughs> um, I just thought if I was going to be able to do it, I would do it. But, you know, it's interesting that those options are available for those for whom it works. Whereas for food, yeah. what, you know, what is the equivalent of the nicotine patch, um, a dopamine patch or. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a dopamine lozenge or something like that. Oh, that's funny. Well, you know, I think when it comes to other addictions, family members get it, you know, a lot better. Like they, I think, I think they know, like if somebody is an alcoholic that they probably can't have alcohol in the house and they respect that, but they don't get it with food because you know why not all food is addictive for all people. Right. And not even alcohol is not addictive for all people, but, but I think with this model, it, I, and again, it, it doesn't help that so many of the wonderful doctors don't even see it as an addiction. You, you had texted me something, Susanna, that you, you learned in the, the start solution certification course that Dr. McDougall actually said about environment. Yeah. Yeah. He actually, um, let me see if I can pull that up. Um, in the just, meantime, Zena, I remember when you had a job at the, I guess it was like a, an ad agency or something, you had some tricks that helped you when, when there was junk food in that environment. Yeah. Um, I worked at an ad agency for, um, almost like, right, like about 20 years. Um, but what, in the first part of that time, um, we were in one building and then some years, um, many years later about, I don't know, we were there for 13, 14 years of the time that I was there. And then like six years later, we had the last six years I was there, we were in a different building. When we moved to a different building, it became kind of problematic because in the first building, um, the receptionist desk, like they had a, a bank of elevators, you'd get off the elevator and there was a receptionist desk. And um, my office was kind of like, I'd go by the receptionist desk and just right behind that area. That was like kind of my shortest way. And they'd always have a candy bowl there. Well, when I was trying to avoid the candy bowl, I just walked the long way around and that was easy. But when we moved into a new building, they started putting candy bowls like every 10 to 12 feet. And so I could not, not leave my office and go anywhere, and, like anywhere <laughs> in, the, in the building without passing by these candy bowls. And like I said, I was a, a kind of a very compulsive type personality and I was stressed at my job a lot of the times. And sometimes I was not even realizing that I was eating candy and I would go to the bathroom at the end of the day. And I would find like all these candy wrappers, you know, it would be like the fun size candy bars that they have for Halloween, but they, we just had them all the time. And just to go from the, the entrance door to my office, I would pass by like two or three bowls of candy and they were on either side of me. So it was like, I could avoid them much of the time, but when on days when I was really, really stressed out and working long hours and not, you know, paying attention and just my mind was elsewhere, I was shoving candy in my mouth and not even realizing. And I'd go to the bathroom at the end of the day. And this one time I pulled out like 20 
plus candy wrappers from like the pockets that I had shoved into my, my jeans. So I was opening and just shoving them down. And I had no recollection. I mean, I like literally had no idea that I was doing this. And I was, I was like, who put all these candy wrappers in my pants? It's like, well, I think I did it. You know, I'm pretty sure that it's me. <laughs> but I was like, okay, so I kind of went on a quest, like, how am I going to avoid this? So I tried many different things. And what I finally landed on is that I would bring a bag of apples to work. And I had a really pretty bowl that I put on my desk and I wa had washed the apples in the beginning of the week. And I made it a point before I'd leave, before I'd walk away from my desk, I would grab an apple in one hand and I would grab a folder or a notebook or whatever in the other hand. And then that way, as I was walking by and candy bowls are on either side, if I went to reach for something, there was something in my hand. And that was enough to stop me and kind of bring me back to present. So I wasn't doing that mindlessness, you know, that kind of just like not being mindful about it. And I would reach for, you know, and if I was really hungry and wanted something, I had the apple so I could take a bite of the apple. But I'll tell you something, nine times out of 10, I came back to my office with the apple intact, you know what I mean? So the apples would last me at least all week long and sometimes a little bit into the following week. And after I started doing that, I didn't have a piece of candy for over two years. So I was, um, but it took a while to get there, you know, I mean, it took, I, I tried different things. I tried having something in one hand and I had the other hand that was free and, you know, so, um, but yeah, that, that really helped. And I wanted to say something else about what you were talking about, like how um, not everybody's a food addict. And I, I do agree and that is true, but I think more people are addicted to things than they even realize. I think we just have a better handle, a, like a better understanding of it, but we've gotten to that point to where we've kind of accepted it. But I mean, I see it in a lot of people. If you ever ask somebody, oh, could you give this item up, whatever it is, pizza, candy, chips, cheese, you know, whatever, and just watch their faces and their eyes will get big and they'll be like, oh, I don't, you know, it's like, I'm not even telling them they have to, I'm just asking them, can you give it up, you know, and they go, oh, no, no, it's like, what is that if that's, if you're not addicted to it, like, if I said that, could you give up broccoli, most people would be like, yeah, okay, I like broccoli, but I don't care, you know, it's okay, it's, they don't have that same reaction, but if you, if you ask them about their favorite junk food or steak or, you know, hamburgers or something like that, they kind of freak, you know, they flip out over it. Um, the other thing I was going to, I don't like to pick on my mom because I adore my mom, but she loves potato chips. So I buy her potato chips and we keep them in a bag that I have AJ's picture on. <laughs> it's taped up. I made a photo of this magnet I have of AJ and she's going, don't even think about it. So I made a photocopy of that and I tape it in the bag and I keep my mom's chips next to her on her bedside table tied up in this, you know, um, opaque bag with AJ's picture on it. That helps me like not dip into her chips. But it's really funny because sometimes I'll be like, oh, these chips, I hate these chips. I'll be muttering to myself and she'll be like, okay, I'm not gonna eat chips anymore. And I'm like, okay, fine. So she's said this to me several times, right? And she's like, don't, I'm not gonna, I, I don't want you to buy me chips. I'm like, okay, fine. So we'd go maybe a week or so. And she'd be like, I want some chips. I'm like, didn't you just tell me that you weren't gonna be eating any chips? She, I changed my mind. And so she did that to me several times. And the first time she did, I was really excited. I'm like, you know, chips in the house, you know? I was so happy. And then I was like, when she asked, okay, fine, I'll get her the chips. And then, you know, some time went by, she'd say it again. And then she'd be like, get me some chips. And that went on, you know, by the fourth time, I'm like, you're lying. Don't even tell me not to, you know, stop lying to me. And she'd laugh, you know, because I'm like, you're a liar, mom. You're, you're, you're going to want these chips. I know but, you're going to Could you them. next time she says that videotape her on your phone? Oh, and she knows. Like she remembers. Yeah, she remembers her say. She, it's not that she forgets saying it. She remembers, but she just, her desire for them is greater than her, you know, wanting to honor <laughs> honor that and it's like and, and she a healthy chip won't cut it for her huh what, what is a healthy chip no. well i mean like for instance i take me rancho thin credibles and i bake them i mean i air fry them for five minutes and with salsa and i i think yeah. i've had people that eat sad tell me they taste better because of the crispness and you know yeah, that doesn't work with her no it doesn't uh for for many reasons that i won't bore you with but um it's um but yeah, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of funny <laughs> in a way. Now, the other thing with my mom, though, is that she's one of those people, she will open the bag, she'll take four or five, eat them, wrap it up, put it away, 
And that's all she'll have. You know, she might do that once a day. She might do it twice a day and that's it. Whereas for me, I've said this before, I will eat the entire bag and then I will go and get another bag and eat that one as well. And I will keep eating till all the bags are gone. So it's, there's a different level. So, but she's got the addiction as well. It's just, she doesn't recognize it as an addiction. So that's just, oh. I, I think that's true really for a lot of people. They, they don't recognize their, you know, well, you know, when people, when we tell people during, you know, the reboot and other programs, AJ, that, you know, can you just go, can you ask your loved ones to keep, give you a clean environment for 30 days? I mean, that's like a reasonable request. Who couldn't give something up for 30 days? I'll tell you who, <laughs> an addict, that's who can't give something up for 30 days is somebody who's an addict because they, they're like, oh, well, I don't need to give it up. Why, you know, it's like, well, if you're not addicted to it, why couldn't you give it up just for 30 days? For, and you can even have it outside of the house, you know, but they don't, you know, they don't see it that way. So. Nope. Yep. A comment from Linda. Thank you for sharing this, Jesse. I appreciate your honesty and we're behind you looking forward to an update in the near future. And a lot of people are using the word junkers. I always used to call them just regular <laughs> people because that seems how regular people eat. And, uh, but, but Rich has a good point. The longer you stay compliant, the easier it is to stay compliant. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. And Susan says at work, I'm surrounded by junkers too. I'm not really attracted to it. What I do is pause and think about values. I also will recall the taste in my memory and that helps. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like you talk about the pause. See, like now that we all, well, all eyes are on Jesse now. So Jesse's got three of us to call if she's feeling <laughs> a little shaky and wanting to go out. Because sometimes if you can get distracted, you can get that craving to die down a little bit. You know, one of the things I want to mention about cravings is, it, it, you know, it's kind of like if you ever have an itch, you scratch it. It doesn't actually make the itch go away. You actually end up scratching it more until like it's kind of bloody. And with craving, <laughs> you would think, well, I have a craving. I'll eat this thing that I'm craving and the craving will go away. But it's actually not true. What happens is the craving actually intensifies. So you want more, 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 more. And this is uh, Dr. Lyle talks a lot about that in his lecture, The Conditioned Cram, which I think you can get on Dr. McDougall's website. So uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Do you guys, ever, I, I don't know if, if you are, know this gentleman, Jesse, or even Susanna, but Zena has been with me since like, you know, like before, before, you know, when I was still heavy 2010 or so. Do you remember when Dr. Roger Gould came to Auntie Mel's house and talked to us in person? So this was really interesting because Dr. Roger Gould is a psychiatrist who wrote a book with a really clever name called Shrink Yourself. So the idea is shrink like a psychiatrist, like use therapy on yourself. And he had this wonderful interactive program that was deemed as successful as as one on one therapy. But one of the things he always talked about is creating a pause. And that if you can just when you have this craving, instead of just immediately indulging it, if, if you can not indulge it, it generally it will die down or at least lessen. And sometimes it goes away entirely. And that's where like the impulsivity thing happens. If it, And it's it's hard because you know that's with, with addiction you want it you want it when you want it you know and you want it now uh there, there was wasn't there a commercial about that but uh if you can create that pause and one way to do it is being in a program calling a friend you know doing something else painting your nails taking a bath walking your dog you know because it, it, if cravings were 24 hours a day every second nobody would ever be able to be compliant but generally they wax and wane. I do feel though that what you eat today, you crave tomorrow. And so one of the things that's difficult about going off plan is that that's your last memory, the last thing you had. And that's what you, so, so that's why I feel like it's really important to have greens at every meal. And somebody actually said that recently in an interview to me is that, you know, what you eat at the last meal, you want at the next meal. So greens for the win. That's what I say. Even though I'm this far in, I did uh, on the 23rd, I made a conscious decision. It, I planned it for a couple of weeks that um, the my daughter, my daughter-in-law, a fiance and a girlfriend, I for years have wanted to take them out. It, I don't know if you guys have this in the States, but it's called high tea. And here um, there's this really cute little old fashioned white house and you get this little room is just like really sweet and, you know, three tiers. And I found out that they have a vegan option. Now, yes, it would have had oil, salt and sugar. And I really weighed it like, am I going to throw myself wildly off track by doing this? Now, I decide I did decide to do it because um 
it felt really special to me. And the, the being together with these girls kind of doing this thing as the matriarch of this family, so to speak, just felt really special to me. And I, I also really needed to be aware that this was a one time, like it's not, and I just didn't want it to turn into roll into the 24th and the 25th and the 26th and just be wildly off track. Um, but I'll tell you, I, although I'm glad I did it and I, and we had a really good time and, and the girls all really felt it was really special and they felt really loved boy, for days, I thought about that. <laughs> I thought about how things tasted. I thought about these pistachio muffins. I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And I, and it really brought home for me why I have to be abstinent from these things, because it just, it just lit me all back up about it. And I didn't like that feeling anymore. And I think that to your point, AJ, is that the longer you're off of these things, the better it becomes. And, and it, it actually has gotten quite easy now because I I've learned that my cravings are just feelings. They're not a need. I don't need to eat chocolate or cookies or bread or any of those things. They are not, they're just a feeling. Also, I did find that thing that, um, that you asked me to look up um, that I had sent you. I had, I have just finished Dr. McDougall's starch solution certification course and passed my exam. And, um, but one of the lessons um, he, the title of this little section is called keep bad foods out of sight. And it says avoid temptation by keeping unhealthy foods you crave out of your home and workplace. If a food feels like an addictive drug, when you eat it, you have a hard time stopping. It's not a good food to keep around. And then that also reappeared on the exam. The, the question on the exam that I took a screenshot, if a food feels like an addictive drug when you eat it, you have a hard time stopping. It's not a good food to keep around, true or false. So just you thought that was interesting. He's going to be on the show tomorrow at 10, everybody. And you should you should maybe put that in the chat. I don't have to say your name because he's the one that says that there's no such thing as a, that food's not addictive because you don't die from the detox. Yeah, but you could, right? In a, in a roundabout way, you could get heart disease, you could get diabetes and die from those things. Right. So it's it's just a longer term. Just yeah. not instantly. You know, it, it, to your point about ha having the memory of those things, uh, Els is saying, if, in, if it's in the house, it's not necessarily in my mouth, but it's always on my mind and it's nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. And that's the story that, you know, this is why I feel like people that are very uh, at the top of their game when it comes to this, if it bothers them, like Dr. Lyle talks about how he had to get another refrigerator. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't deal with having certain things in the house. But I remember when uh, Dr. Goldhammer's wife, Dr. Jennifer Murano, who's the co-founder of the True North Health Center and the editor of the book, The Pleasure Trap, when their daughter came back uh, from college or was visiting, they didn't, she didn't live there anymore. They had a refrigerator downstairs and it, she's not vegan because she wasn't raised vegan. It was from a first marriage and the daughter was going to some party and she was the one that was going to bring the ice cream. And this was regular ice cream, not even vegan ice cream. And Dr. Morano said that the whole time it was there, she just kept thinking about it. And she said, you know, I'm not going to eat it because I know, you know, dairy's not good. I'm, you know, she's vegan and whatever. But she said it drove her crazy that it kept banging on her brain, just knowing it was there for those three days or whatever. So, you know, just don't feel like there's anything wrong with you if you don't like having junk food in the house, because that's pretty normal to always desire the most calorically concentrated thing in the environment, which I don't understand. When doc, this is the thing, and I don't ever want to argue with Dr. Lyle because he's like the smartest dude I know. But, you know, we were at this vegan restaurant the other night. And so they made compliant SOS free food. And some of it, like there was this thing, like it was like, it had like a cashew Alfredo sauce, which probably was the most calorically dense thing of, that we had, but I would rather eat pho than anything else. And that was like literally the least calorically dense thing on the menu. Um, I have it with rice instead of noodles, but Dr. Lyle said it's because it was tickling some kind of salt circuit or something. But but it's funny because I've really learned to enjoy lower calorically dense food. The, the higher stuff just, it doesn't it doesn't feel well. It don't, I don't feel well anymore when I eat a high fat meal, which I will be eating Saturday, January 13th. <laughs> oh, so, so it's funny because this one meal that I had September of 2022, 
two. Yeah, that's how long ago. I'm still thinking about it. It was Sun Cafe, their nachos. And uh, I'm going to be in actually in your neck of the woods, Zena, for a memorial. And so we're going to be going to that restaurant. And so it, it's great because it's not like I can get that very often. You know, it's not like I'm going to get on a plane and fly to Burbank and then, you know, so it's, so, you know, if I get it once a year or actually once every two years, I'm okay with it. But I remember when I had that, it was so good. You know, it was so, I mean, it was, um, there was no oil in it, but it was so high fat. It had cashew cream cheese, high a cashew sour cream, high in fat, guacamole, high in fat. It had chorizo made out of sunflower seeds, high in fat. Um, anyway, it was just one big fat bomb. So instead of having it over <laughs> chips, I had it over, uh, Uh, jicama, you know, they made little chips, but man, that was good. But, but, you know, it's interesting because as delicious as it was, I didn't feel full, if that makes sense, because I need volume to feel full. And, and that, that basically was a no starch meal, you know, fat and vegetables. So I don't know, the starch is what really seems to satisfy me and make me not have cravings, the starch and the greens. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Jean says at this diet, Oh yeah, no, she, I already read that comment. She doesn't have a desire right now. Uh, Julie says, I lost my mom three days ago. I'm so sorry. That's a tough time a year for sure. And I'm not eating normally. I keep junk food out, but I opened a gift and had chocolate in it. I lost control, but I'm confident this is temporary. Giving myself a little grace, but not too long. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, Dr. Lau tells a story of like sees candy when he's given it as a gift. He picks out his two or three favorite pieces and puts it in the trash. You don't have to necessarily put it in the trash. You could give it to somebody, you know, If if you don't want to have that. Okay. I mean, I have a bottle of olive oil in my house and I've had it for years. I use it to grease the, this, this mechanical part of the juicer, but you know, I don't, I mean, so you could say that's calorically dense, but do, do we ever drink, uh, you know, oil? Yeah. Uh, Jennifer says, I have some unopened sad food for parties that I could get rid of by putting it out. But if they didn't finish it by the end of the night, I know it would be a big problem for me. I can't open it. ever. And so like, if you're having a party or entertaining, just send it home with the guests. I mean, Shada did that once somebody brought a cake and, and she sent it back to the person. They go, I don't want it. She goes, well, it's going in my trash can. Then she goes, and the person goes, you wouldn't do that. And she, she threw it in the trash. The only thing is, is we right. know, some people could eat out from the trash. So you might want to put it actually like in the kitty litter <laughs> or down the garbage disposal, you know. If I, I have to plan my meals or I might fail, says Bonnie, it's hard for me to lose weight even when I'm clean. And if I drop the weight, comes on right away. So, well, uh, Bonnie, Dr. McDougall's on at 10 o'clock. Why don't you come and ask him why why that is? And because uh, uh, maybe he can help you with that. He's been helping people with weight loss for a long time. Karen says, Chef AJ's Daily Show is what keeps me going. Every time I think maybe I'll give up, I just can't see myself eating meat and dairy. Oh, but you had mentioned, uh, Karen, that she had a Taco Bell addiction. If you guys know Chuck Carroll, the weight loss champion, he was eating, what, what did he say? It was 20,000 calories a day from Taco Bell? Yeah, I, 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 there's something I'll tell you privately that could get you off Taco Bell. I'm not going to say it on a show because it's pretty, <laughs> not, it's pretty disgusting, but I heard it from a kid that used to work there. So yeah. I'll share it with you on tech, Karen, and maybe that could help you. Joanna says, the cleaner I am, the healthier I feel. Breast cancer survivor. I'm very blessed that my kids are very supportive of this way of living. When I get sloppy, and I do, I just feel like a failure, not willing to do that anymore. Well, don't, don't, don't feel like that. I can't tell you what to do, but that's very, that's not helpful if you beat yourself up for an indiscretion. You gotta, you know, you just gotta just say, I, you know, I could have had some steamed kale. Like I could have had a V8, you know? Uh, Karen loves the 30-day experiments that Dr. Lyle suggests doing. Um, Beth says, my husband won't. He will keep chips and cookies out of sight, but all the other food is there. It's hard. Well, you know, there's, um, we have a locked food safe. If there's anything that I really can't handle here, Charles will put it in there. And you can also, instead of putting things in like clear, you can put it in dark things so that you don't have to look at it or put it on a really, like if you're short, put it on a really, really high shelf, for example. I mean, there's there there can be some workarounds within the environment or just get your own pantry or your own cabinet or your own refrigerator so you don't have to look at somebody else's stuff. AJ, um, I pulled these out to show people um, because we were talking about food safe last That's week. That's I have, yeah. And so I have two of these in my freezer. Now these come with a like little combination lock thing here that somebody could set like so if somebody has a teenager they could give them one say keep your junk in here 
and the teenager would set their own combination so you can't get into it but because i have these for my mother and i could if i accept the combination i know what it is so i have padlocks on it and then i keep the um keys on um a uh, little um uh, what you call it um Cord. Like the next chain, yeah. Yeah, it's like a little cord that I have her little ribbon thing. And then this is another little one that I made. This one goes in my fridge and like the deli drawer for some more of her other stuff. I see I pulled everything out because I didn't want it to go <laughs> bad. But this is one I made myself. It's so funny. It's like I couldn't find something small enough for the fridge to go in that drawer. So I have all these plastic containers that they're just taking up space. So I thought oh, I'll just let me give this a shot. I got two, uh, a packet of two of these like little padlocks from um, the 99 cent store. So for a dollar, and then this was free because I already had it and I poked holes in it and I put these in and then I keep her um, cheeses and stuff like that and this and that goes into the fridge. Um, and the key is on the same cord. And then I've got like the, what um, Susanna showed in the beginning, like big tub. I have one that's actually about twice as big of that that I have for her like things that could go in the pantry. Um, they, they don't need to be refrigerated or in the freezer. It's got a lid on it and I have more padlocks on that as well. And that's the third key that I've got. So you can put, and the things, this thing that goes in the freezer, I put her like pita bread and stuff like that in one of them and other things in the other. And I take my frozen vegetable bags and I put them on the top. So I'm not like, when I open the freezer door, I'm not like confronted with them, you know, like they're not in my face because this, you, because you can, you know, see through this. So that's just a thought for people. Yeah, you know, you can maybe have a whole company of making things for people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little like DIY that. stuff, yeah. Well, you know, I think people that don't understand this probably think, God, why would you go to such extraordinary lanes, you know? I've, I've got a worse food addiction than most people. And yeah. so it's, it's. Um, I told this story in the, the FFOF check-in. I, I have never actually, I had kind of forgotten about it, but it came, this memory came back when I was, I think I was like 14 years old in high school. I was a freshman in high school. I was in my art class and somebody offered me a piece of taffy and it was actually a friend, which I thought this was kind of rude, but she offered me a piece of taffy. And of course I took it and I ate it. And as I was eating it, the flavor changed. It started out sweet and then it turned kind of like weird, like kind of peppery and whatever. And I kept eating it and eating it and eating it. And she's like looking at me and she's like, does it, doesn't it taste weird? And I'm like, num, 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 num. and I swallowed it. She's like, you can spit. She kept telling me I could spit it out. What was a joke thing? It was like, it was like a little joke. Oh, I'm from people. the magic store. I remember those. Yeah. You, you give it to people and it changes flavor and they're supposed to get grossed out. Well, that's how bad my food addiction is. I didn't even throw it out. I, I swallowed the thing, which she was just looking at me like really bizarre. And so, um, I, you know, I was kind of embarrassed by that, but that's, like, you know, when, when people say that, oh, I can have this kind of candy, but not that kind of candy. Um, yes, I do have things that I like more than other things, but it won't matter to me. If it's there, I will eat it. So, um, you know, I've told you the thing with the Brazil nuts that I never cared for Brazil nuts, but this one time I was at a cooking class and the cooking instructor had like a little cup and it had like four or five Brazil nuts in it. And it was on the front of the table and I was sitting, I was in the front row. And so it was like maybe two or three feet away from me. The whole two hour presentation, I don't remember a word of it because I was so fixated on those Brazil nuts. I couldn't stop like looking and I don't even like Brazil nuts. And I just, all I wanted to do was grab the cup and just shove them in my mouth. It was, it was a really weird um, experience, but so yeah, so some of these things that I do might seem extreme to people. And hey, most people probably don't need to go to this, you know, to that extreme level. But I just want to offer it to people who might be a little bit more like me, who have more difficulties than maybe their counterparts. There are, there's always something you could try to do. Move it into, a, you know, get another fridge, get another shelf or cabinet or whatever, put your stuff away. Um, I like locking it up because I'm the only one who goes into, into things to get stuff for her. So Right. And when all else fails, have a session with Dr. Lyle yeah. or don't even wait for all else to fail. So here's a comment from uh, Sandy. The holidays have been hard for me because of family visiting and expecting to go to restaurants and eat non-compliant food. The family's going home January 10th, but I'm starting a new tomorrow. Yeah. Everybody on this, uh, on this broadcast right now, throw it out now, throw it out now. Okay. Uh, but, um, my pattern is giving up says Julie. So I'll learn to take, to, to safely take care, take myself where I deserve to go sooner or later. 
Um, Monique says, I truly believe the saying, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. I think every time I have of buying something non-compliant. Uh, Josefina says, I have a problem with always wanting to eat big portions, even if it's healthy food like raw vegetables. Wonder if I'll ever be satisfied. Well, ladies, we know the answer to that. S-T-A-R-C-H, you'll never ever be satisfied eating vegetables <coughs> or maybe even possibly even fruit. You gotta have starch, that's the key, satiation. Vegetables are healthy, but they're not gonna fill you up. Sometimes, Zena, we've talked about this a lot in FFOF, these people that go off the rails, because I think they still come from the weighing and measuring mindset of eating small portions, or if they're eating large portions, it's only vegetables. And the thing is, is I, it's I, when people tell me they binge, it's always a lack of starch. Yeah, they're, I agree. They're always afraid to eat starch. You know, because I, you know, I think a lot of people hear um, your statement about eating vegetables first, and then they don't hear the rest of your statement, which you always say, and then follow it up with starch. So it's like, they just hear the first part of that, you know, eat vegetables. It's like, oh, great. I'm just going to eat vegetables. But you always tell them that they still need to eat the starch. And I second that. And I know Jesse and Susanna would, would also second that comment um, because there, without starch, there is no satiation. And starch, no satiety. Starch is to the hunger drive, but oxygen is to the breathing drive. And that's so hard for people to get that, that you can eat large, satisfying portions of it. Yeah. I yeah. I learned that from Dr. McDougall and the, um, the very first time I went to um, his program back in 20, 2003, and he was talking about, and I think he's written about this in his books as well, so people could read it. But he was talking about like how he would be at dinner time when he was, you know, a younger um, child um, living with his family, and he would sit down and have a big plate of food and always have like a lot of meat on it, and he'd eat a big plate of food and he'd still feel hungry, and he'd get a second plate of food and sometimes a third plate of food, and even though his stomach would get all stretched out, he was just still feeling unsatisfied and, and hungry. And it wasn't until he learned about the importance of starch and how, how that satisfies, like you said, the hunger drive, it's to the hunger drive as what well, oxygen is to the breathing drive. And um, when I heard that, I, I, I understood it because I used to be like that too. I used to go to my parents' house, even as a, you know, as an adult on like Sundays and my dad would grill steaks and big steaks, and I would eat two or three steaks. I mean, I would eat up to 60 ounces of steak in a single meal, and I could still eat more, which is, it's crazy, you know, to think about that. I feel kind of the same way with vegetables. Like I could eat vegetables. I mean, I'm not like, okay, let me back up a little bit. I'm not saying vegetables are like eating meat. Okay. Not at all. But in, in the, if I just ate nothing but vegetables, I'm still going to, I'll feel like mechanically full, like my stomach will feel full but my brain is going to still be craving something else. So I found that when I get enough starch in, that quiets that hunger drive. Absolutely. I And that's why I never was a fan of that fruit and vegetable day that JP would recommend to people because I felt it was setting them up to binge. One thing that's really helped me with starch is because um, generally the starches take a little longer to cook. And so having stuff in the fridge, like right now I have four cooked sweet potatoes in my fridge, a whole container of rice cooked in the fridge and a whole bowl of those little nugget potatoes. And I've had those in there for two or three days now. And what I do is when say for dinner tonight, I'm planning on just doing a big kind of green salad with lots of chopped up vegetables. And this is just for my husband and I, and I use those uh, wooden Ikea bowls, one each, that'll be our dinner. And so, uh, you know, three quarters full with um, like spring mix. And then I'll split a can of um, salt-free beans and then I'll dice up a bunch of the starches on top or sprinkle on rice, or I keep quinoa in the, in the freezer and just break off a chunk. I've always got um, a big container of oat groats or oatmeal or whatever cooked always in the fridge. And so I don't have to start every day. Like, and when you're learning a whole new way of cooking and eating it takes a while, you know? And so for me, at least having those parts done helped me be successful right away because I wasn't hungry. This is the first time I've ever been, I've been on so many diets and diet plans, Jenny Craig, body for life, Susan powder, 
Weight Watchers, a gym, I've done it all and nothing worked. Nothing because I was always hungry. And I'm never, I'm never hungry except when I'm right before I eat now. And that's just such a big change for me. It must feel tremendous. It does. It absolutely does. Yeah. I saw a comment about somebody that had a snack accident on French fries, but see what the uh it did disappear. So I'll go to another one first. Uh, see, that's why I really need you guys because my chat disappears. And actually, the comment about the flour, somebody getting a Stacy getting derailed on on bread or flour, that disappeared as well. So, anybody making New Year's resolutions tonight? While I look for those comments. Well, we're not. We we didn't wait for New Year's, so we're rereading the Pleasure Trap, and of course, in FFOF, AJ, we've been reading your book for weeks, and um, you know, and we are continuing with what we hope will continue to be a successful strategy here. Um, but but we definitely, like I say, this started three weeks ago. We were not going to wait for New Year's Eve. I, you know, you, you need to just do it now. Um, if you do have a snack accident, the next meal needs to be a really good, healthy meal. Um, so waiting is, this is the only thing I don't procrastinate at. I'm a terrible procrastinator, but not with doing the next meal better. <laughs> oh, wait, are you, you're a Libra, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, you said you can't make up your mind. Somebody's asking you what was harder, food or cigarettes? Oh, cigarettes. I, I I would, because I know that sounds like it's not the right answer because I haven't succeeded yes, yet in the food department, or at least not. I have lost 55 pounds, but that was a very slow process. And I truthfully have no idea how I lost that weight. That goes back a number of years. But I would say that I was, I am much more addicted to cigarettes than I am to food. Um, the problem with food is that I can't stray at all. I, you know, I really need to be, <laughs> unfortunately, really perfect. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether it's an issue of commitment or willpower, um, but I think we've got a strategy that kind of maybe avoids those two things at this point, and we'll see. But cigarettes were much worse. Yeah, well, we can't wait to hear one day what this strategy is. I did find a comment from Jackie. I have slipped and ate some French fries and vegan cookies, but it didn't even taste good to me like I remembered it tasting. And then I say, why did I do it? But I think it was just for nostalgia. Uh, when you want have nostalgia, go see a movie that you saw when you were little. You know, go watch The Wizard of Oz. It's coming back to the theaters, those kind of things. And Stacy said, for the first time in three years, I totally got derailed with flour this year. I think it was actually triggered with those dates, sweetened who chocolate chips, and then the sugar cravings and flour came. But yeah, that's true. That could be, uh, yeah, the, 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 Dr. Goldhammer forbid me for having tasting those who chips. So uh, I did taste one. I had to on a shoot, but they are very good. What are they? I, uh, the, it's a chocolate chip. It's so funny because when I graduated culinary school in 2003, I said, gosh, why doesn't anybody make a date sweetened chocolate chip? And I found a way to do it, but it was really labor intensive. You literally had to like pipe each little chip and dehydrate. I go, nobody's ever going to do this. And then it, it's finally been invented. So many things I invented when I was little, like when I swore to God, I invented VCRs when I was like seven years old, because <laughs> I said, I remember, I don't remember what show I was watching, but I said, you know, I, cause my parents made me go to bed and I'm like, why can't there be a way to watch this show later? You know? Kind of, or, you know, or, or, or we, when I was little, I used to like both Johnny Carson and Joy Bishop, they were on against each other, two things. And I'm like, I wish there was a way I could say, you know, so I, I mean, I didn't invent it, but I had the idea for it. And, and that's why when people say you, somebody stole my recipe, it's very possible for more than one person to get the same idea. And I, I remember when I was little, I, we used to have Oreos, which turns out they're vegan, uh, but we're talking in the sixties and that was my after school snack. And I, I didn't like, I like the white stuff better than the chocolate stuff. And so what I would do is I would break it in half. I, I don't know what I'd do with the excess chocolate wafer. And I would make double stuff Oreos like on my own. And then all of a sudden it came out. So just so you know, I invented, I invented, all that. I invented Netflix. I invented, no, I just, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, hey, AJ, I used to I used to tape when I was a little kid. I had a cassette, you know, uh, like a little cassette player, tape recorder, and I used to tape shows on my cassette recorder and just it wasn't like the video, but I used to listen to them. So it was kind of the idea. Yeah, that's neat. I, you know, when I was little, not little, I was like in my 20s, but still, I used to be, talk about addiction. I think those of us that have that gene, we're we get addicted to anything. So, and this was actually before they had VCRs. Um, I was addicted to the show, All My Children, because I had started watching it. This is so silly. I was 11 years old when it came out. I was obsessed with Erica Kane. I still think she's like so beautiful, Susan Lucci. And it, this is so funny because when I, you know, in the sixties, there was like only three channels to watch. I mean, now we're so overwhelmed. And, and, and again, I think there's something like a process addiction of the Netflix and all this kind of stuff, which is why I'm so glad that the, I'm like, it's kind of like you're dependent on your mom for the key to open the, the, the food thing. I'm dependent on Charles to have any viewing, which is good because otherwise I could sit there and just watch TV all day like I used to, or maybe I'm working and it's on, but I, because not having a TV and not having access unless he provides it for me works out, out really well. But when I was little, I always liked the show Bozo the Gla Clown, oh, yeah. which came on at 12 o'clock. <laughs> And at 1230, remember, we only had channel two, four and seven back then. And I think maybe there was four and nine, but they, they weren't very good. And we had the rabbit ears and there was something called VHF and UHF. And so right after Bozo came on the show, All My Children, I believe it started in 1971. And I watched it because it was the only thing on. And so I had been watching this since I'm literally 11 years old. And so before VCRs were invented, I th there was a radio you could get that played television without picture. And so I could never miss the show. So I always had this special radio with me so that I could be listening, you know, to it. So I don't know if they still have that radio, but that, that, thanks for making me remember that. Elle <laughs> said, I quit drinking and smoking 40 years ago, at least one at least once out of my system it was better haven't touched once either thank heavens congratulations and uh yeah you know who i really like i really like listening to you know to vera tarm and talk about addiction you know because uh some of the things she's because so many of the people um they get off one substance just to go on another substance you know and 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 they don't realize that they all kind of play a role together so like if you're having you know a pot gummies or you know you know other things it's you may be off sugar but you're not really free of addiction you know right. Yeah. So I just, I just want to be free of all of them because I, I don't like the feeling, honestly, you know, you talked about how, when you tasted the food, it wasn't as good as you remember. And I think that's the case for many people, but even, even hyper palatable food that doesn't taste good can still give you that hit of dopamine. And that's, that's part of the problem, which is why, you know, I used to say to somebody, at least, at least, you know, Zena, and she said, well, this, you know, don't worry because, you know, this, 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 I don't like this flavor ice cream. At, you know, vegan ice cream. And it, you don't understand when you, it doesn't matter if it's not your favorite flavor when, when you are, are using food as a drug, it really doesn't matter. Okay. My mm, Aubrey, I like that name. My mom had my dad put a fridge in the garage for his beer because it hurt, because all her veggies took up so much room in the kitchen. Nice. Does it change to white? Oh, Struthi says, does it change from white knuckling to be a go okay with tempting foods? What was it? What did she say? Does it change from having to white knuckle it to be okay with tempting foods? For me, it hasn't. And I've been food, I have, I've been sugar free for uh, almost 21 years, flour free and oil salt free for like 10 or 15. I don't think it does, but I'll let everybody else answer. Does it change? Um, I agree. It doesn't change. I, it does for me and it doesn't. So I would say that, um, Four, four months after I did, uh, I, in 2005, I did Dr. McDougall's Maximum Weight Loss 10-Day Program. And four months later, I lost like my craving, like I, I achieved that thing that you call AJ, a calm, stable brain. And I kept it as long as I stayed away from the crap that had addicted me, okay? But I feel like I only managed it. I didn't, I didn't get rid of it. If some years later, some of those things started creeping back in and how you were just saying that, like when you eat something that you don't, it's a, you know, high, you know, hyper palatable thing, but you kind of lost your taste for it. I will say this, you can bring that taste back because if you keep at it long enough, it will become your preferred thing again. 
at least that's what happened with me because if I got into stuff that I wasn't really liking, you know, that I was that I had stayed away from, I'd lost kind of a lot of the memories around it. I'd lost the, the my brain wasn't calling for me to go for those things. But if I started slipping and started eating those things and I kept at it, that would come back so fast it would come back right away and then i was once again struggling to get back out so i don't feel like i've overcome food addiction but i feel like there are times when i have managed it much better than other times yeah absolutely I think not practicing addicts <laughs> you know we're abstinent addicts yeah that's really what it amounts to so um and obviously kind of went away for me pardon I, I was just going to say the white knuckling kind of went away for me because I used to be such a right. chocolate addict where I was just, I'd have to eat chocolate like two, three, four times a day. And then after that four months passed, it just, I, it just changed. And I go into our break room at work and like in the holidays, being at an ad, ag ad agency, so many vendors would send us stuff and it would be boxes of, I mean, like boxes of cease candy boxes of chocolate boxes of you know the caramel corn you know just like the holiday things and I'd walk in there and I wouldn't like I wouldn't go for it like I would just kind of walk right past it and it didn't really call to me but if I was really hungry <laughs> or if I was if I stayed in there too long oh yeah then it would start coming back but yeah so my white knuckling definitely kind of dissipated but it it's always just waiting to come back. You know, it's just wait, you know, all I have to do is eat something and then keep eating it. And that, that white knuckling is going to come right back for me. So, but you're right, Jesse, it's, um, we're trying to stay abstinent. We're not, I, I don't know if I believe that there's something like a recovered food addict. I mean, I, I don't know because I don't think I'm ever going to be recovered from it. I will manage it the best I can for probably the rest of my life. I always like to say in recovery, you know, but, you know, everybody's different. I yeah. I, I just want to address something that uh, Vicki is saying, if I could put it back in gallery mode. So I had to switch it and I'll explain why. We multi-stream here. And so it, even though it is a YouTube show and we much more prefer and appreciate you watching on YouTube, it also goes to Facebook, Twitter, and as of yesterday to Instagram. And when I started the show at the four screen, nobody on Instagram could see any of us. So I apologize, but we, we do have to do it this way if we're if we're Instagram, Instagram streaming. Also, people that are watching on a phone, this is a little bit better of you for them. But I understand what you're saying and why you like it that way. Uh, Dixie says, what temperature are you cooking the Mi Rancho tortillas? There's a video that I made a couple of weeks ago of the 10 Christmas recipes in under an hour where I show you. I do it the way Al Schmidt taught me where he, he turned 88 yesterday, by the way, we did a show on that. I just cut them into eighths and I do it in my Breville on the air fryer tray, five minutes at 350 and they come out perfect every time. And yes, we're gonna do a reboot program starting in January. If you're on my mailing list, you'll get all the videos and information about when we're starting. And if not, we'll probably come on here before with JP and talk about it. Uh, somebody does it at 400 at three and a half minutes. Patty does them that way. She says they come out great. And let's see anything else. I have nuts in the shell in the house and I find that helps without enjoying too many nuts. Yeah, because you, you get tired. That's how our ancestors ate nuts, by the way. They weren't in three pound bags from Costco. So, you know, yeah. Right. Karen says, I think addictive tendencies and behaviors exist on a continuum. Some of us will struggle harder. Absolutely. Everything I think in human behavior exists on a continuum. That's why the most important thing isn't an arbitrary rule, but to know yourself. Uh, Aubrey says, once I was on a binge that was going on for a couple of days and I just got in the car, went and visited my aunt to just get over it. I was better off visiting her. Uh, okay. Uh, do you like to use your champion juicer for an ice cream as much as your other machines? Well, if it's for banana and ice cream, I think the champion is unparalleled, but I really love the Ninja Creamy because then I can get the scoopables. So... And honestly, I haven't had ice cream in so long because it's just been too darn cold here. I have four pints in my freezer. Does that, do, do all of us here have a Ninja Ninja Creamy? Or is it just me and Susanna the only we one? Just got, I just got one for my kids for Christmas, actually. So so they had some fun trying to figure that out at Christmas. And I've got some pints frozen in the, in the deep freeze to throw in there. But it's pretty cold here. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. So, it, I mean, we've had a warmer 
winter, but I, I have no hankering for ice cream right now. Same here, but when the summer comes, you can just take a can. What I like about the Ninja Cream is you take a can of Dole or any kind of pineapple unsweetened, put it in there and spin it. Zena, didn't, weren't you going to get it, but then you changed I'm, your mind? I, I was going to get it. I actually even ordered it once and it didn't, there was something wrong with the order. So it got refunded or whatever. And I, I ended up not getting it because I just, it, it's like, first of all, I'm not sure how much I'm going to use it. If I want to make nice cream, which I haven't done in a really, really long time, um, I'll just use my Vitamix. Um, so I don't know that I get that much use out of it. But then there's also the scared part of me where I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to just be whipping up lots of bananas and, you know, bananas are just so easy for me to eat. And I just don't want to be eating that many of them. So I, um, yeah, I just rather, I'd rather do like frozen fruit and then um, just let it kind of thaw out a little bit. And, um, you know, I like it like that. So like frozen banana with maybe some frozen berries that are just kind of slightly thawing out. And then that's like a nice frozen treat for me. So, and I'll just eat that. Uh, Struthi says, Zina, thanks for being vulnerable and showing us the cages. I love that word. You're, they're cages. They're cages. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny because, because wild things have to be locked up. They're ca I love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tina says, there's a reason why they call it taco hell. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Fast food. It's just so bad. I mean, when I think back before I went to the McDougal program, I had for about close to seven years, I was doing nothing but fast food three times a day. I mean, three times a day. I wasn't like uh, Chuck Carroll, who was, it was it Chuck who, uh, who you said, Chuck with, with the, yep. yeah, the Taco Bell. I mean, I had, to, you know, I do Taco Bell and then I do McDonald's and I do, I burger, you know, there was no fast food place that was safe for me. And, um, and I wasn't just getting like one little sandwich. I mean, I was getting like, I'd get like the sandwich and I'd get the, the fries and the hash browns and like, I'd get like, 10 things in each meal. And it was, um, you know, in that like seven year period of time, I, I had gained, oh my gosh, I don't know, over a hundred pounds, um, maybe close to 120 pounds or something. And not only that, I gave myself type two diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all these things before my 40th birthday, I was already on seven prescription meds, you know, and it was like, that's, you know, it's, that's food addiction and that will kill you. <laughs> I mean, that will kill you. I mean, the, the detox portion of it may or may not, I don't know, but it's, um, it will kill you. So, um, but yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't, it still makes you miserable. So that's, yeah. Well, cause I was not happy. I mean, I just, I wasn't, I was not a happy camper cause I was my highest weight, I think was around 272 and I'm five foot six. So I'm not as tall as uh, Susanna. Um, I don't even know what my BMI was. I, I think I stopped checking and, um, but yeah, my cholesterol was just as high as my weight <laughs> and it, you know, it's a horrible thing. So, um, going, you know, and what Jesse had said earlier about, um, you know, she, you, doing the health thing to me is as important, if not more important than the weight thing, because the health stuff is really that those are the killers, um, the way that, yeah, it's not it's not great. And of course we all want to lose weight and be thin and, you know, whatever, but the health stuff is really, really important. And, um, I was just very thankful that Dr. McDougall was able to get me off of all my meds and see, I just started seeing my numbers reverse that very first week during that program, my cholesterol dropped 51 points after he took me off of the Lipitor, you know, I mean, that's kind of crazy and getting off all those meds and not having, you know, the angina that I was having and not have, you know, I'm, I honestly did not think I would live past um, my um, 40, uh, 45th birthday. I was 40 years old when I first went there. And I thought if I don't, and I didn't even go there because I wanted to lose weight or, or get off my meds. I went there because I, I wanted to be an ethical vegan. I stopped eating meat, but I wanted to get off of dairy and I had to be locked up. Right. Because it's like, it's the same thing here. It's like, I had to lock it up, you know? And so I had to go and, uh, and do that. But, um, in the process, I found out what a health, a really, a truly healthy diet could do. Cause I had dieted my whole entire life and lost the program. Susanna mentioned, I did all of those as well. Um, but yeah, so it, it was kind of ridiculously amazing how fast I got healthier and the weight loss came, um, a little, you know, slower than that, obviously, but it's, it's just so much better not being type two diabetic, not having, you know, 
chest pains when I walk, not having sciatica when I would try to walk my dog. I would used to be in tears 10 minutes into my walk because my sciatica would hurt so badly. And then, you know, after that, it's like I could walk for hours without any pain. I mean, it was it was truly just so liberating. So I would encourage anybody just to make the lifestyle changes they need to make to get healthier. It just feels so much better. Absolutely. And I believe if people go get, you know, do this for health the correct way, the weight loss eventually will follow. But I think people are chasing weight loss first yeah. in, instead of health. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's ways to lose weight very quickly that we don't feel are healthy if that's your only goal. Uh, so Pam says, um, well, how do you do this? Where do you start? Is there a program you recommend? Well, I sure recommend a few depending on your budget. Uh, if your budget is in the thousands, I recommend True North of the McDougal program next month. If it's in the hundreds, then consider my program that we'll all be in called the Ultimate Reboot Program. It's a 30-day program starting January 16th. Information to follow. If you're on my mailing list at chefaj.com, you'll get it faster than anybody else because it's... Uh, we just tell our list everything first. Florence says, I've stayed at the office last week, but it's so strange. I would eat part of the candy and not like it too much and then throw it away. And 15, 20 minutes later, I'd go get another piece. That shows you the power of the addictive foods. Uh, Julia, hi, welcome, Julia. I just threw out some crackers left from Christmas. I was eating some here or there. And, you know, you know, there's that old saying, you know, when you're uh, uh, from AA, when you're out getting sober, your addiction is in the corner doing push-ups. Florence says, I'm in my office a lot longer than I'm in my house. The office is an environment I don't control. So we've had people that have uh, improved their environment. I don't know what your job is and what foods that are tempting there, but a lot of times people have talked to HR to either get that food. I've, I mean, I've worked with pl places where they just had terrible, just the Costco snacks and we switched that up. So now they have a Vitamix blender and they make fruit smoothies and green smoothies and they don't buy the junk anymore because I actually came in and did an in-service about that for the people, why it's not making their employees more productive, but less and more sick. And uh, that you can change the, you know, like for example, like where, I don't know where your desk is relative to the food, but we had some, you remember Auntie Melzina who said, oh, the customers, I have to have, you know, you know, candy for them. And I said, let's just do an experiment, you know, while you're in this 30 day program and, you know, instead of, um, you know, instead of candy, what about like cutie oranges or like little bags of almond or, or even a Lara bar or like, what about a pen? You know, see, I love pens. I'm always losing a pen. I personally <laughs> would much rather have a pen, you know, a free pen. And she actually said that when she did it, the customers were like, oh, thank God, I just couldn't stand coming in here because you had all this candy. I mean, customers may not complain about that, but, you know, you never know. So and they've done studies that like, like, for example, Florence, like, again, without knowing your company or, or the logistics of where your desk is relative <laughs> to the food, you They've even done studies where like if the secretary had to have the obligatory candy jar, instead of putting it on her desk, if she put it 15 feet away, say on her filing cabinet, she would eat less if the candy jar was not see through. So, there, you know, there's some strategies you can work with, but I would definitely talk to HR and get that approved, improved if you can. Or, you know, the best thing is when you're when you're the boss and then you can have a rule that you don't have that kind of stuff in there, you know, or have healthier stuff. Okay. Uh, thank you for all the happy new year wishes. Um, Jean says the more time you, you pass or skip the fast food stuff, other others you're with may have the stronger you'll get at it. Yes. Yeah, so it's like building a muscle. Is there an accountability group? Uh, Beth, Zena runs FFOF and they have a, a forum and we'll be starting our reboot program any day now and like a little bit over two weeks. Reading the pleasure trap says Esther and the start solution now and we'll be joining. Oh, you'll be joining the McDougal program on the 11th. Welcome. Nervous, but happy. I'll be one of the instructors. I'll be doing a cooking class. I think it's the, the second Thursday or Friday. So I'll see you there. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, Elle's watched w y and R for 40 years and stopped. I finally stopped at one point, but but I, you know, like, like, like the way Jesse stopped smoking, I stopped watching all my children. Like one day I just said, you know, I, I I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't live in Pine Valley and, and, <laughs> and Ruth is not my mother and it's just time to get a real life. You know, I just, I, but I just, I was obsessed with that show for a while. You love Susan Lucci too, huh, Tracy? 
Yeah, she just, I thought she was lovely. She said one of her secrets, because she looks amazing. I know she's in her 70s. Is she does something that I never did is she takes her makeup off every night. I don't really wear much anymore, especially any, nothing on my eyes. But I, I got to be honest, I don't do that. But yeah, it's about time she finally won that that Emmy, you know? You miss the cartoon shows of the 50s and 60s. Those were my favorites. Scooby-Doo, Jetsons, and the Flintstones, my three favorite. Even before that, I'm old enough. Can anybody remember Cecil and Beanie? Oh, boy. That shows how old. I think I might be uh, too old to remember that show. But I, I do love those. I love Lucy. All-time favorite, though. This way of eating is the best thing I've ever done, says Cindy. Took me a year to lose 35 pounds. I can pass very easily on the foods you used to eat. Congrats. Uh, oh, Aubrey was in Bozo's audience. Nice. And Bozo made fun of you. What a Bozo. How much is Ultimate Reboot? It's $197. Price hasn't gone up in years. Uh, will you be emailing? Yeah, yes. If you're on my mailing list, Patty, we'll be emailing that out very soon. And we'll also have some broadcasts related to that. Uh, open that. Ah, oh, so Tracy says, I've lost 212 pounds and I have not overcome food addiction. So there you have it. Uh, and that, Tina was obsessed with Bozo when, when, uh, she was little, but now she thinks clowns are creepy. Yeah, they can be. <laughs> uh, I'm working on the sources of the addiction, hoping to dissolve the craving or address them. I'm not sure what you mean by the source of addiction, but, um, we feel that what Dr. Lyle says is true is that we're genetically hardwired to prefer the most concentrated source of calories in our environment. And that is what causes this, not like past trauma or things, not that those things aren't important because uh, even if you clean up your, I mean, if everybody lived at True North, we wouldn't have this problem, but the world, the world is, is we're set up to, you know, for, for this disease. It was given to us everywhere we go, every, every step you take, every, it's everywhere. This, the bad food is out there. And, and the thing is, is it's not even agreed upon that it's bad. That's the thing. It's, it's just, it's such a part of the culture that it's just, just like eating animals is considered normal. What those of us that have been vegan for years are like, we don't get it. Just eating junk food is just considered, it's celebrated everywhere you go, every, you know, every nurse's station, every, every, a pet store, bank. I mean, can you go anywhere without being exposed to cramp? That's why the environment is so important to control if you can in your own house, because you're going to have to go outside sometime and see billboards and all kinds of things. That's that's one of the reasons I don't generally like eating at restaurants. The ones here don't don't trigger me because everybody in the group is eating healthy food. You know, not some of the people aren't eating like vegan pizza and vegan cake. We're all eating the same. You know, I mean, there might be different entrees, but it's it, it's not like it was when in LA and I'd go to like, say a real food daily and I'd get the real meal deal with the steamed kale and the brown rice. And the person next to me would get the, you know, the vegan Fostas cupcake and the lasagna. So here, um, because actually, you know, it's interesting because the three restaurants that I eat at, they're all kind of Asian. There's no dessert menu. So I, I don't get triggered by entrees, you know, not well, unless it's nachos, but really I don't I, I was more of a, a dessert type person, but now I'm savory. Uh, the champion juicer really you think is cheaper than the Ninja. That's interesting because they don't make it anymore for commercial use. And when they were making it, it was over 200 and the Ninja you can get for almost half when it, when you see it at Walmart. So I'm not sure about that. Uh, um, um. I uh, having trouble with the creamy. I'm sorry about that. Hey, um, ladies, do any of you have any plans tonight? And you know, I'll tell you what I'm doing. If you tell me what you're doing. It's a real quiet night for us here. <laughs> I think some of my younger kids, the 16 year old is having a couple of friends over. And I think the 18 year old's going out with some friends and yep. So we're just going to have our salad and beans and potatoes for dinner. And, um, and yeah, it's just, just a quiet night. We've had a really busy Christmas. We had 16 people here. And so, so we just need some quiet time. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still um, recuperating from 38 people at Thanksgiving. <laughs> what are you doing tonight, Zena? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Hanging out with my mom. We'll watch some TV. Maybe I'll, I'll be in bed before midnight, I'm sure. And um, yeah, I, I was telling my mom this morning, uh, I was kind of joking with her and I was saying, you know, when I was, I think I was like 26 years old, I went to a, Chris, uh, a New Year's Eve party at a friend's um, house 
and um, I was driving home and it was like about 2.30 in the morning and there was like nobody on the road and I was just like blocks from my house and I was driving up the street and I had a green light and I was re ready to cross the intersection when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a pickup truck coming this way and he was not slowing down and something told me put on your brakes and I put on my brakes and he whizzed right by me missed me by an inch and he never slowed down and after that I never <laughs> I don't go out on New Year's Eve it was like that was just such a and it's been I'm 60 years old now that happened when I was 26 and I've never forgotten it and I, I don't ever want to go out for New Year's Eve isn't that horrible but um, no it's not horrible we don't go out New Year's Eve because yeah. the people that do drink are always yeah. on the road or if we did if we were to go out we'd be make sure we'd be home by nine o'clock you know yeah exactly I think maybe I did once or twice go out and got back like eight or nine o'clock I was like oh, pop in and say hi and come back but yeah I, I yeah it was it was just too scary I'm just like no you know it's not worth it yeah yeah we we're gonna have we're gonna have a quiet night at home tonight with uh we'll be making some calls to friends and family and um and roasting up some cauliflower and having some falafel and probably some raw red cabbage salad I don't know why but those three three things seem it sound good together. So that'll that'll be our New Year's. And probably listening to some neighbors set off some M80s when we get close to midnight. That'll be about it. <laughs> oh, my. I'll tell you what I'm doing because there's actually a question about it from Gina. Could you tell us how you do your vision boards on New Year's Eve? So I got to be off by five because Tammy and Tom Kramer are coming over for dinner. And I said I'd make her whatever she wanted. And she literally picked the easiest thing I make, which is the tostadas. And oh, I made I made a special dessert though. And so we're going to be doing our vision boards. They only live three miles away, so they're safe getting home. This was last year's vision board. Oops. And so what I do is all throughout the year, I save magazines and I put them in a big box. So I have two big banker's boxes full of magazines. We've got a bunch of these boards, scissors, glue sticks, markers, tape and we cut them i mean i don't know how anybody else does it i just cut out pictures that appeal to me uh, maybe phrases and then i do that first and then i space them on the board and sometimes i don't finish it in one night but i will get my pictures picked out and this is what we've been doing for, uh, like literally forever i some people call them inspiration boards treasure maps but i i believe they work that's how i got uh to speak at McDougal's conference years ago. I kept putting him on my vision board and gold hammer. So yeah, that's what we do. And it should be a lot of fun. And I thought about like streaming that, but it could be kind of boring because we wouldn't be talking so much. Gunther says, I'm still stuck on the weight loss thing. Instead of thinking about being healthy, how can we help you reverse that thinking as uh, health first? Uh, Monique says, Zena, did you reverse your diabetes and did you get off all your meds? Uh, yes, I did. Um, and it would happen very quickly for me. And this does not, my experience is not necessarily everybody's experience. Um, but because I was, I did go to the McDougal 10 day program and, um, uh, I, my, the disease, because I was still relatively young at that time, I was, you know, 40 years old and I'd only been on, I'd only been diagnosed with type two diabetes for about a year, year and a half. And, um, the angina and uh, the heart disease and stuff that I had from that was within the last like year to six months before I went. Um, and the six medications that I was on, I was on seven. One of them was an antidepressant that I could not be taken off right away. I had to wean myself off of that, which I did over the next several months after the one week program, but, or the 10 day program. Um, but I, um, Dr. McDougall took me off of six medications the very first day. So he took me off the metformin, the two blood pressure medications that I was on, the Lipitor. I was also on um, Imitrex for migraines. And there's one other thing in, oh, the um, nitroglycerin for my heart because I was having that the angina, the angina pain. Um, so he took me off that on day one. And then um, seven days later had more blood, you know, they do blood work the first day and then blood work seven days later. So you get like to see um, your results in about a week. And um, all my numbers came down. So I went from having um, my fasting blood sugar, again, not that high, but while I was on metformin, metformin, my fasting blood sugar was around 130, 135. When he took me off of that by the end of the week, my um, blood sugar was 85. And it's been 20 years. And every time I've had um, 
you know, my blood sugar checked. It's always been between 78 and 85. I think one time it got up to 90. Um, and that was like the highest it's been, but it's usually right around 80, 82, something like that. And I have not been, I'm not on any medications now. Um, haven't been in 20 years after he took me off of those. So yeah, so I reversed everything. The last time I had my cholesterol check, my cholesterol at one point was like to um, 278 when the doctor had put me on Lipitor and for a year and a half that I was on that, it lowered it down to 269. So it went down what like nine points. And then Dr. McDougall took me off of Lipitor and after the week it dropped 51 points. So it was, you know, it went down to 218. And then I think a year, year and a half later, the next time I had it checked, it was down to like 125 or 120. And the last time I had it checked, it was I think 124, 125, something. So it's kind of stayed there. Um, my blood pressure, which was very high, even on two blood pressure medications, it was still running 160 over 100. He took me off of those. By the end of the week, it was back down to like 120 over 80. And now it runs around 100 over 70, something like that, 100, somewhere around there, 100 over 70, 100 over 60, 65, something like that. So yeah, so it works. It works. I, I feel like I'm living proof. Again, not everybody responds that quickly. Some people who are diabetic, they might have had diabetes for years. I think I was very lucky because I was I wasn't diabetic. I hadn't been diagnosed with it for that long, and I hadn't been on the medication for more than like a, I think a, less than two years. It was probably like a year and a half or something that I was on it. So I responded very quickly, and um, it was it was great for me. So other people might have struggled a little bit more with their with their um, issues. But yeah, uh, like I said, I, I didn't expect to be, make it past 45 and I, and I didn't even go there for health and I got health from it and I got weight loss from it. And I, I'm 60 now. And so I'm just happy to be here <laughs> and still breathing, you know? Remember when Dr. McDougal came to your house for dinner and you were so I, nervous, you bought a new dining room table, you bought a Breville air fryer. <laughs> You were so nervous. I was so nervous. I was like, we're going to have six people here. My table only seats four comfortably. <laughs> so I wanted to get rid of that table. That was such a people. memorable evening. Yeah, it was, it was really, I was, you know, I love Dr. McDougal. I've known him for like 20 years, but I was so freaking nervous. I don't know why I was so nervous. He but... makes, he has that effect. You know, <laughs> we had some very observant viewers and uh, Instagram people were commenting on the earrings that I wore at the beginning of the show. Why did I take them off? Well, I foolishly put the clip-ons over these and it was hurting, but what, what good eyes people have. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Struthi. Did I give up flax seeds for a while when getting healthy? I gave up all nut seeds and avocado on the 2nd of January, 2012, and I've never returned to them ex except for, you know, I have chia seeds occasionally in a recipe that I'm trying to thicken and I do get my fatty acid profile every month and it's excellent. So I don't worry about that. Um, all uh, right. My only struggle is getting some oil when I go out. Yeah, uh, Lynn, that's tough. That's why we've worked with the restaurants here and they make SOS free for us. And maybe that's something you can do. Yeah. So thanks for noticing my fancy earrings are gone. Yeah. Those restaurants. Well, Dixie, if those restaurants have desserts, I'm not really aware of it because it's not like going into real food daily where the first thing you see is this gigantic bakery case like you would at the Cheesecake Factory. So, um, and they're not really, I don't want to say they're not good desserts, but they're not, they're not the kind of desserts that I think of as desserts. For, hey, Laurel Paley in the house. Happy New Year, Laurel. Good to see you. Laurel had a great birthday party for her 60th birthday at the, at the Marionette Theater. That was so cool. Sandy, where have you been? Why did I move? It was like five years ago. I moved because I didn't have a vegan community or a vegan doctor. And now I have both. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up soon, guys, because Tammy, I mean, you know, maybe we could keep going. You can say hi to Tammy and Tom, but they might not want to come on. Um, okay, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, I could do, a, you know, I, I've never done a live for vision boards with this. And when we've had groups, we've done it, like when we had the mastery program, but they, they're kind of boring, I think, to watch people just sit there and cut out magazines. Uh, but you can do it, you can do it virtually, like not virtually, but you can do it with a computer. Some people just don't go to Google images, like, because not everybody has magazines anymore. It's just, I've always saved them over the years, you know? One thing that I picked up from the reboot course from Xena was to get the free app called Canva, C-A-N-V-A, and you can make a vision board there. It's easy. Yeah, it's fun. That's cool. And you can then you can update it all the time and, and change it too. 
if you want. Anybody else doing a vision board other than me? Just me, huh? All right. Well, then I guess I'm the only one that's going to have any success next year. No. And we have to do it. We have to do it now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Actually, AJ, uh -huh. I was thinking about doing a new one for 2024. Um, it's, you know, a few months ago and I, I didn't do it. And now I'm thinking, now that you brought it up, I'm thinking, yeah, I should probably be doing that soon. Well, they're fun. They're kind of fun. And, uh, you know, set your intention. Jacqueline, I don't know which guest you mean. What does your guest actually eat? I want to drop all my meds too. There's still a couple spaces, Jacqueline, in next month's McDougal program. Um, we all eat pretty much whole food, plant exclusive, starch base, no sugar, oil, salt, and uh, lower calorically dense on the scale. So, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of mention a little bit, like kind of what I eat. And I think Susanna and Jesse and, you know, all of us probably eat similarly, but just to give some, I do what AJ recommends and eat vegetables for breakfast, usually about half a pound to a pound of vegetables, uh, depending if I'm having greens, it's closer to half a pound. If it's, uh, you know, Brussels sprouts or something, it's a pound, or I might be, be making a big salad. And then I have some starch after that. Usually for me, it looks like oatmeal and blueberries, and that'll be my second breakfast. And then for lunch, I might make a big salad. Um, Susanna was describing her wonderful salad um, a little while ago, and I'll do the same a similar salad, but I actually like to put my starch on the bottom. And then that way I'm eating veg because I like to see, I try to sequence meals. So I, I like to eat the vegetables, which are the lowest calorie dense thing first, and I'll eat my veggies. And then I have to work down to get to my starch. And then it's kind of like a little buried treasure for me because when I get that bite of starch, Ooh, it's so good, but I will make a huge salad. I'll do like, um, cut up sweet potatoes in it or rice and I'll do some beans. I love garbanzo beans. So it's either garbanzo beans or some black beans in there. It'll be a big salad. And then for dinner, I might have um, maybe some steamed or roasted vegetables and maybe some baked potatoes or something. I like Yukon's. Um, so it's really simple. I, I don't cook a lot of recipes. Sometimes I'll make one of AJ's soups or chilies. And that might be um, something that I'll eat from, you know, several times and I'll freeze some of it and then I can pull it out and have that and put that on top of like some chili on top of a baked potato. And it's really yummy, yummy because it's got the beans and the veggies and everything is already in there. It's kind of like, a you know, just a done deal. So it makes it really easy. So very simple. Um, I would mention that Susanna has done a couple of um, interviews with AJ on, on AJ's daily show. And she shows some beautiful, some, she shows her food and her food pictures are gorgeous. I mean, so, and she has, you know, lots, I mean, she does really great pictures and she's, she's always sent texting me pictures of her food. And I'm like, Oh, that looks so good. It's like, should I move to Canada? You know, <laughs> she's like, her stuff looks really, really good. Um, I did an interview with AJ back at what mine was um, August of 2022 during AJ's food addiction week. And I don't have, my pictures are not as good as, um, as Susanna's, but I do so, show some pictures of some of my meals and stuff. And they're very, they're very simple. So if anybody wants some ideas, you can look those things up. And for anybody that doesn't know where to start AJ's book, yeah. this helped me so much. This kind of lays it out um, and talks about the why and the how, and it's also available on Audible, which is really cool. And it's AJ reading it. So then you kind of hear that voice <laughs> it keeps you on yeah. track. The scolding voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are these are the two books. These are the two books that everybody should start with. AJ's book and Dr. Lyle's and Dr. Goldhammer's Pleasure Trap. Um, that it's AJ started it off with the the why and the how, and you know Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer have given us a lot more information on the how and what we can do. So, yeah. Um, and my foods, uh, we do oat groats and usually it's broccoli, uh, red bell peppers, corn, kale, mushrooms, onions. I mean, everything starts with onions and oat groats. That's our first meal of the day. Usually that's sometime after the uh, AJ's 11 a.m. live. So we eat our first meal at noon or one, sometimes later. And our second meal is at six or seven, depending on when the first meal has been. And that's baked Yukon Golds, baked sweet potatoes, um, again, vegetables, raw vegetables, particularly that may be when we have our salads, soups and chilies, you know, depending on the time of year. It really is simple. We don't, I like herbs and spices, but we're not big variety people. We go with the same vegetables 
and uh, and pretty much the same grains. Um, and oat groats are, are our favorite. They've really replaced rice and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and that's that's it. Uh, yeah, it's, would... it's really easy. And, you know, to the extent that we can, we have been eating to the left of the red line and we have been sticking with the program and sometimes we can't. And I think 2024 is going to be a better year for us. Oh, uh, Suzanne gave me this bracelet just to remember the red line. <laughs> uh -huh. Put it on my left hand and then take it. Because the ones we used to make were kind of like plastic and, and the black letters would often fall off. I still have that on my, my water bottle though. So, but this is very cool. Thank you for that. You yeah, know. and AJ's book is a great, what like uh, both uh, Jesse and Susanna mentioned because for people who do need recipes, um, AJ has a bunch of recipes in that book. And then you can also watch her weight loss Wednesdays. She's got, I don't, AJ, how many videos did you have from weight loss Wednesdays where oh my she God, shows how to prepare things? And it's, they're wonderful uh, videos. A lot of people just use those and just, you know, to get started. And how many did you say? I have 300 weight loss. 300. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so you can watch her making these foods and stuff. It's, you know, it's all there for free on her YouTube channel. So yeah. check it out. Yeah. And then, like she said, the reboot will be coming up in um tw what like twenty days. Yeah. So um that's also another place to get you know although that's paid, but it's a great place to get support. And I think sometimes when we pay for things, we're more like gung ho about it. At least in the beginning, we're like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. I like, I, I plunked down some money. I'm I'm you know well, I'm gonna. There's an old saying: people that pay pay attention. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Debbie says, I struggle with vegetables for breakfast. Please suggest some. Whatever vegetable you hate the least, oven roasted ratatouille was always one that people that didn't like vegetables seemed to enjoy for breakfast. Yeah. I started by sauteing some zucchini. That was the one, like I, I could not get my head around vegetables for breakfast. It made me nauseous just thinking about it. And so I could just lightly uh, water saute a little bit of zucchini. I would, I would weigh it because I didn't know how much a pound of vegetables even was so so I didn't eat a lot of vegetables before and so um one good size zucchini did it and so that's sort of how I started but now I'd say I probably eat before cooking I probably eat about a pound and a half of vegetables every morning but I don't eat like Jesse I don't eat my first meal till around noon and um that's always my vegetables first then my oats and berries after that and then um you know a couple of weeks ago, AJ, you had on Dr. Scharfenberg for his 100th birthday, and he talked about not snacking. And so I've been really thinking about that a lot. And because I snack all day, like I, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen and I, I realized I, I realized how much extra food I'm taking in every day by snacking until dinner. And so I've been really working on just having that good sized meal, the vegetables and the big bowl is probably, I mean, I don't measure, but it's probably close to two cups of oats and a cooked and a cup of berries. Like it's a lot of food. I don't need anything else until dinner time. It takes me all the way. And so that's just something that I've been working on lately is not snacking. And I've really realized I'm, I'm certain it was a habit and not a need. I wasn't hungry. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'll share what I do for vegetables. My first vegetables for breakfast, because I was like, Susanna was saying, it's like when AJ first started talking about that, I was like, uh, no, I'm not going to do it. I was just like so <laughs> adamant. I, and now I'm such a big proponent of it. It's, it's really funny because when you try it and when you finally get it to work, but I wouldn't do it for two years. And I will say, I don't think you absolutely have to do vegetables for breakfast to lose weight. You will lose weight. But it, having the vegetables for breakfast, it does help. And what I, like I said, I rejected it for two years. What I did is I had made um, AJ's um, uh, gla mustard glaze. What is it called? Glaze Balsamic Dijon glaze Brussels sprouts. And you were the one that discovered you can actually glaze them afterwards and then yeah. you get your, your silpat dirty. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but I had made those for dinner and I'd made like a big batch of them. And so I ate part of them and I put the rest in the fridge. And then the next day I was going to pack those up and take them with me to work um, for lunch. And so I opened my fridge and to pull them out and I was standing, you know, 
inside the fridge and I took one because I go, those were really good. I, do, are they going to be as good as I remember them from last night? So I took one and I ate and it was cold. It tasted even better. It tasted so sweet and so yummy and it was chewy. And I was just like, Ooh, and I started eating them and I ate the whole container that I was planning to take with me as part of my lunch. And that was my first vegetables for breakfast. And I was like, Oh, I just did vegetables for breakfast <laughs> and I like it. You know? <laughs> so, and I started out slowly that way. And I just made those darn Brussels sprouts every day, every day. Um, and that, yeah, like AJ said, I did figure out how to do it easier and faster because I would just buy this um, frozen, the petite frozen Brussels sprouts from like Trader Joe's and just throw those into the air fryer and then add the mix the glaze up and toss them after they're done. But I like them refrigerated because when they're refrigerated, they just get like, I don't know, sweeter and more chewy and just more delicious. So, um, but that, that was my first vegetables for breakfast. So find a vegetable that you like, or like AJ says, the one that you dislike the least and try that. And I always tell people if you're, if, if you can't do vegetables for breakfast, if you can eat a cherry tomato, start by eating one bite, one bite of whatever vegetables you, you make, and then you can have the rest of it for lunch. That's fine. But just eat one bite before you eat your breakfast. And the next day, try two bites and, you know, just slowly build on it, you know, but I would also say if you absolutely are against doing vegetables for breakfast, don't let that stop you from doing everything else. Please do everything else because right. you can, you know, I, I found it. it took me two years, but I did it. <laughs> again, there's no way to study this. You know, how do you do, don't, you know, like the way they study medical research. But, and again, I don't know everybody. I've only worked with a few thousand people, but I find that the more a person, the more, the, the more the, the person is a food addict, the more uh, repulsive vegetables for breakfast sounds because my husband, it's not a food addict. He's never been overweight. But when we changed the ultimate weight loss program on January 12th, 2012 to be vegetables for breakfast, he just went along with it. He's like, oh, everybody else is, you know, and he's like, he loves it because he, he you know, this leads into a question that, that I see here from Bonnie. Well, what about fruit first? You know, the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. That's why we like high fat, hyper palate. It's why we like, you know, uh, chocolate better than kale. And so if you're a sugar addict, I, I don't think there's anything unhealthy about fruit. And I think fruit can be great to make your greens go down easier, a little pineapple or mango with your steamed kale or fruit in your salad. But, you know, when you activate that sweet taste first thing in the morning, I feel like People just crave fruit all day because fruit is so sweet and delicious. You could just eat it all day, but I guarantee you can't eat kale all day, you know, on it. And so um, you can do that. That's not the plan that I devised for people that have sugar addiction and food addiction and weight loss, because you want to eat the least calorically dense thing first, which is vegetables at hundred calories per pound, or actually less for some vegetables, because you never will go back to them. Like if you didn't have your, you know, sweet fruit for breakfast, there's a good chance you'll have it later because it's so delicious. But how many people eat their full starch meal or whatever and they say, oh, you know, I think I'd like a salad now. Or I think I'd like steamed vegetables now. So some people just go right into the 50-50 plate, which is great. But I recommend first you have the vegetables and then you have the 50-50 plate because you know most people aren't eating anywhere near um, enough vegetables. And Dr. Furman and others recommend a minimum of two pounds, one pound raw, one pound cook. And if you don't start the day with vegetables, how are you going to catch up? How are you going to catch up? When are you going to get them in? So even people that eat oatmeal for breakfast, I recommend putting some greens in there. So again, yeah. you know, I always say it's not a court ordered program, do what you want, but we know that this works. We don't know whether or not you'll be able to do it, but we know that anybody that's done it has had tremendous success. And uh, I remember, I don't know if you guys, uh, well, again, Zena came first, first came Zena, then came, no. and <laughs> Zena in, in the live ultimate weight loss conference. And I don't remember Sherry, who gave the story about how she was, um, she came to the program, she was already lean, but she came there for food addiction because nobody else understood it in the plant-based world. And she, she was eating oatmeal for breakfast, no no weight problems, but she didn't feel like she was part of the group. So so she said, oh, for a month, I'll just eat vegetables for breakfast. And, you know, and then she lost three pounds. She didn't need to, but it's amazing how, uh, how you know, vegetable consumption is just so linked to weight loss because, it's just, it's just one of those. And, and also that's the other thing. If you eat fruit first, fruit's great, fruit's healthy, but there's no thylakoids in fruit. And if those thylakoids that are in the dark green leafies, that are going to help you fight your cravings for all those other things that you uh, might want to not get into if you're on a health and weight loss journey, you know? 
Yep. And, and, and you know, there's this thing called a salad smoothie. It doesn't look pretty generally, but uh, you can, John Pierre taught me this and actually tastes pretty good as you make a salad, but you blend it up and a little bit of dressing or lemon juice and just put it in a dark cup and you'll, uh, you'll like it. Guess, guess what companies here? I, I've been, I've been stalling so that you can say hello to my friend. And you know what, somebody's asking what the purpose of vision boards are. It's just to set your intention. You want to see, I got, I got some celebrity, local celebrities in the house. Uh, I'll let you say hello to them if you want. Oh, here, I'll get out, oh, of, you get out of my way. Oh, look at you. You dressed you up and I dressed I, casual today. Oh, Tammy got her hair cut. I did. What do you think? <laughs> Hi, everybody. You know Hi, a lot of these Susanna, hey. <laughs> Cassie, Dina. Wow, everybody's here. So what we How were cool. talking about is whether or not the environment is important to your success. In the <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, that's like it's so major. Bit, maybe. Yeah, it's super, super well, just, important. Yeah. I know you look beautiful. Yeah. And, and I'm I taking this shirt off now that she's here. Oh, this okay, is you like, broadcast. I almost wore my pajamas. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, are you okay? I thought about wearing my pajamas. That I really did. She always gives me such a hard time because I'm always dressed nice. And I thought, oh, it'd be really funny to show up tonight in my pajamas. Um, but but then that I would have been that would have been hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> when, and then to do this in my pajamas, that would have been pretty funny. So, um, yeah, you, I think environment is super, super important. When I first um, joined Chef AJ's Ultimate Weight Loss Program, uh, I asked Tom if he would take all of his contraband and um, put it someplace else because I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to walk into my pantry and see, you know, granola the bars. Contraband was like, yeah, granola bars and such. <laughs> Yeah, well, you had some chips yeah. um, still then that had oil in them and some different things. You know, I mean, he was eating plant based, but um, he still, you know, wanted certain things. And I just didn't want to see them because I didn't want to be tempted. And so we um, put took that stuff and he put it in a cabinet in our garage. And like two years later, we were throwing that stuff away. I, I found a granola bar and just actually just a few weeks back. Another one and still in yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> because we, we were pulling the ninja uh, oven out for something. Oh, and yeah. This, and this this uh, mummified granola bar came falling out. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah. Which I haven't actually eaten one of those for years. years. Yeah. So what, what it proved to us was that out of sight, out of mind really does work. Because if that stuff had been in the pantry, he would have continued to grab it and eat it. And because he didn't see it, he didn't he didn't even think about it once it was out of sight. So I relate. And I wasn't even the intended victim of that process. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But you benefited from that. And then we even took um, our refrigerator. We have one of those French door refrigerators and it has a drawer at the bottom um, that um, I guess it's, it's supposed to be for like meats and cheeses, which of course we don't use it for that. But he also had some things in there. And we also kept things in that drawer that were for the grandkids because they do get to eat some vegan cheeses and some different things. And so um, I also, I had, I asked Tom, can you somehow cover the front of that? Because it had a clear, it, the front of the drawer was clear. And I said, can you somehow cover that? And I had a um, green um, chopping, um, what, are, uh, that green um, cut, cutting board. Yeah. But I it was it. a flexible one. And so he took and cut that so it would fit and we put that in the front because when I opened up my refrigerator, I just wanted to see all the beautiful healthy food and I didn't want to see the other items. And that we have left it that way um since 2015. And well we were doing a show and show the doors open and and our grandkid stuff doesn't show in the little green the green yeah. dot the green dot the green screen section. Yeah. So, and, and it's another, you know, that out of sight, out of mind. I equate it, I think of my home environment in this fashion, that everything that I'm surrounded with in my home is kind of like a commercial. And it's, it's a living vision board. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And we know, we know how, isn't that great? We know how powerful commercials are and advertisements and 
pictures. So, you know, we don't have to smell something to get triggered. It even just the sight of it can trigger us. And so I just look at my kitchen and my pantry, my refrigerator, um, and just think of it all as a commercial. So does, does what I see out there represent what I want in my life and help me get to the goals that I want to have? Because I know that if I repeatedly see something that that is high calorie density that doesn't really work for me to have on a regular basis. Eventually, like this one tells you, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. I may, I may even get through two years of not eating it. But you know, if um, if I have a really bad day, I'm weak, and I see it, I might give in. So you do know? you have a list of things that you want to have on the C, the C, what you want to see list? I work hard to stay on that list. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you know, we have bowls of, of fruit out and vegetables out. And so we see those and hi, hi, you want to give me some love? Yeah. People are saying in the comments they love your hair. Oh, thank you. I thank can't you see so the much. chat, but I can see it. Oh, on okay. Phone, but oh, thank you so much. Um, so even in the refrigerator, I like to use the clear glass containers. Hi, Bailey. Okay, okay, okay. That's because you can be so over. nurturing. <laughs> she always likes to she be on my lap. Um, I like to use the clear glass containers so that my batch prepped food is in there and we can clearly see what there is. So when we open up the refrigerator, there isn't a question about, you know, what what's in there, what can you eat? You can visually see it. And, you know, our salads, I don't have glass containers for those, but I have those plastic containers that are um, a little bit transparent. And so we can see the salad. So I open up the refrigerator and everything that I can see, I can eat, I can have all of that food and it looks appealing. And, and that's, you know, that's what has worked for us. I and mean, we, we've been um, eating this way. It will be 11 years mm -hmm. in March. And um, I was listening to a program this morning about the brain and they were saying, you know, the things that you habitually do become your habits where you don't have to think about them. So it's like when we first start learning how to drive, we, you know, if you can remember back when you were 15 or 16 and you were learning how to drive, you had to think about absolutely everything that you were doing, you know, oh, I have to put my foot on the brake now. Oh, you know, I have to turn my left turn signal on because I'm going to be turning left pretty soon. And, you know, you were thinking about all of that. Now, it's you just, yeah, everything it's all, is all right? bad. We don't right. think about it anymore. No, we we don't. And so it's the same way with your healthy habits. Are you not comfortable? That's that, why when that, people that, say, do you have any resolutions? I don't, I don't, I don't believe in resolutions. Them. I believe in habits, habits. Yeah. you know, cause it, you say yeah. I'm going to lose weight. Well, what does that mean? You know? Right. Right. Absolutely. It's all about creating habits and it's about creating, um, uh, an environment that supports those habits because then it makes it easy. And they become healthy cravings as well. Oh, the food does. Yeah, yeah. The, the healthy habits become healthy cravings. So, do you it's want like, mama? It's like we're passing her around. Like I know. Going to I know. Our rock concert. Okay, <laughs> here you go. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, and I think you don't have to focus on like losing weight and how much weight am I losing? You focus on the habits and eventually you'll get there with your goals. Because if you don't establish healthy habits and a good routine, then you're not going to get the end result. So you have to work more on the environment, your habits. That's how we started this with, with the saying from Dr. Lyle, oh. we must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. You know, are you nice. with Adam Sood? He, Adam Sood. You know, he he, yeah. he has a saying, your environment should look like your goals. Oh, there you go. I love it. Yeah. yeah, that's perfect. So, yeah. So that's what we've done. And that's what, you know, makes it easy. And then we just automatically every week build our salads, you know, make 14 salads um, in our batch prepping for the week. That takes care of our lunches for the whole week. It takes us 30 minutes to prep those and they're all done. We um, batch prep 
potatoes and rice and all of those healthy starches. We don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just autopilot to do that, always continually replacing, replenishing those healthy foods. Tom calls it our fast, um, our making our own fast I, I don't food. know of going to Costco and in, in Whole Foods to get the ingredients for those batch prep salads. I don't know if I'm on autopilot on that. It's kind of more like a forced march. Tom, it's time to go to Costco and <laughs> Whole Foods. Right. So the home assembly is great. But even that we have down because we know exactly. Our path in the store. That's right. We know our path in the store. We know exactly where everything's going to be. Costco, we were talking about environment and some people have like things that they don't like in the environment. Yeah. And even to this day, like when I go to Costco, I never walk by the bakery because that's so tempting to me because I used to love uh -huh. their bakery. Yeah. And so I, I go to the store, but I'll I'll just avoid to walk by that. I don't want to see the muffins and the right. things right. in the the smell, the smell too. You oh, know? Yeah, that can totally be a trigger yeah. as well. But when thinking of that, um, you know, Ben and Esther mm -hmm. and Ben used to, to own a donut, donut shop. shop. And I asked him one time, Ben, do you ever want a, to eat another donut? And he said, you know, Tammy, I've eaten a lot of donuts in my lifetime. And he said, and I know what every one of them tastes like. So I don't ever need to eat another mm -hmm. one again. And I love that because, you know, it's just like the bread, the cookies and all that. You can think, well, I already know what all of those taste like. I don't need to taste those again, you know, or you go to your, you know, your mom's house or your grandma's house and they make something and you remember, you know, I used to eat that. Well, don't lament that you can't have it. You know what it tastes like. You know, you don't need to eat it again. I'll tell you what I need you for dessert. Oh. Because Tammy's like me. She likes a little bit lower calorie dense desserts. And yep. Tom and Charles like the fattening stuff. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so she usually <laughs> does make some, she usually makes something that's a little healthier yeah, for her and I. I get the crust if there's a, if there's a <laughs> nut-based nut crust, she'll eat the filling. And then I get the crust like a little high crust cookie. Yeah. 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 It's fun. So, so anyway, yeah. You know, it's a, a new year. It's a fresh start for people who need to have that fresh start. And and every morning actually is a fresh start. So if you have a bad day the day before. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh wow. So, okay. Holy moly. Okay. Wow. Well, so I originally intended to make this. <laughs> and Trish, I think, who's watching, got most of it. But Trish, Charles liked it. I didn't think it was good. So I gave it to Trish. That's not so why I mean, and, and but Trish liked it and I think her husband liked it. Yeah. It's it's still a work in progress. It's a lemon cake. You can oh, taste it, it but I, Charles actually said it was good. But this is what I made. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rocky <gasps> Mountain chocolate factory yeah. back in the day. I used to love their monster apples. And so I created them. Two of them are green and two of them oh. are red. And I used the streusel topping that those of you that took the master class know what that is. And it's basically just stayed. So how fun. This that is looks amazing. Isn't it fun? It's yeah. Just, I cannot wait to eat this. So. That's incredible. Okay. Actually, there's That'll somebody that's going to say hi to y'all. Go ahead. Go up there. <laughs> hi, buddy. Hey, hello, everybody. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey, happy new year. Happy new year. Happy new year, happy Charles. Year you. Yeah. <laughs> I see everybody's dressed up. I didn't dress up tonight. Oh. I thought I'm going to shock. I'm going to shock AJ. Oh my God. I wear pants sometimes, but I didn't dress up tonight. Oh, you did change tops. I was like in those sequins. No, it was uncomfortable. Oh. Well, guys, we want to get to dinner and we want to uh, do our vision boards. So on behalf of Chef AJ's Healthy Kitchen and Nutmeg Notebook, we wish you all the happiest, healthiest, and most prosperous new year. Yeah. And remember. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy yeah, New Year. Happy New Year. And all together, let's wait. Let me put it back in gallery mode. I know that this isn't favorable for the Instagram people, but let's just say how we started with our dish towels. So we want to tell you that in the coming year, if it's in your right. house... It's, it's in, in your, your mouth. mouth. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah. Happy, Happy New Year. Year. Bye. 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 Bye.